call the meeting to order. Uh, we'll do the roll call. Yes, Askland. Yeah. Sims. Here. Housh. Here. McQueen. Yes. Also present is Village Manager Patty Bates, Police Chief almost in a second or two, David Hale, and very shortly, any moment, Assistant Village Manager John Young. All right. We have some swearings in to do tonight. Um, Your voice sounds wonderful. What? <laughs> you, you, were, you were really carrying. Your voice. Ah. In the good <laughs> <laughs> good all right um, so I believe we wanted to start with an announcement about um, John Eastman sort of recognizing John and I think Brian was going to lead lead that up so yeah well as we all know John Eastman was an extremely valuable community asset and his insight and input is going to be sorely missed uh, uh, one of the things that I think we all appreciated about John was his commitment to the principles of Arthur Morgan and to collaboration. And he really made a difference in so many things in our village. Uh, in particular, I, I like to highlight, and, and this was talked about a lot on Saturday, his passion, his enthusiasm, which was contagious. And he engaged so many people, excited people to action. and. We definitely appreciate all the work that he's done that will live on, his leadership, his uh, commitment, his hard work. And uh, he really made a difference to the village of Yellow Springs in so many ways, not just in terms of water-related projects, but many other issues. Um, so we're all going to miss him. And uh, you know, I, just, I, I thought maybe we would just have a moment of silence uh, and respect. All right. Thanks, John. Thank you, Brian. Um, Council would also um, like to announce that we'll be holding a special meeting for the purpose of interviewing finalists for the law director, and that will be held on uh, January 28th of this month. Um, and it will be where the three finalists are Bricker and Eckler, and they will they will do a presentation at six o'clock on that night. Uh, Frost, Brown, and Todd at 7 p.m., and then Coolidge Wall, um, which is our current solicitor, um, will be at 8 p.m. Um, so we encourage lots of attendance and um, we'll be eager to have feedback. The law director is one of the two positions that council directly hires. M many of the other positions are hired by our village manager, so our village manager ultimately hired um, uh, John Young here and also uh, David Hale but the law director is under the direct control of the village uh, council so if you w attend those and have some input we would very much appreciate it um, law directors are very important because when there's a crisis they are very helpful explaining things to citizens but also they obviously help uh, the council to navigate any lawsuits or threats of lawsuits but also just the questions that arise on a regular basis about what are we allowed to do under Ohio law what are we allowed to do in terms of ordinances we might like to pass so it's a pretty important position and we really would value your feedback so please if you can put that on your on your agendas and plan to attend Okay, well now we have some happier news that Brian is also going to lead. Um, Patty moved to town this weekend. Her house was finished and she was able to move, so we got her wow. a little housewarming gift of village, things from village uh, businesses. And uh, I think there's a history of the village, the police report. Yeah, that yeah. was, that was my idea. Oh. Gotta have that. Yeah. <laughs> the Glen Helen calendar, a bag from Tom's. Um, oh. So, at any rate, we're we're really thrilled that <laughs> oh. <laughs> we a growler and <laughs> some little treats from the Yellow Springs Distillery. Oh. And who well, knows thank you what all very very much. It was uh, my chiropractor's not happy with me. My massage therapist is exceptionally happy with me. <laughs> um, but. Um, 
we, we are mostly in the house. The, the cats are with us in the house. Um, <laughs> it did only take five days for Molly to come out from under the dresser, so <laughs> we are good. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Yes. Well, Thanks, Patty. Patty built a new, Patty and her husband built a new house out in Birch 3, and mm -hmm. so we're thrilled to yeah. have a new house, a new yeah. new residents of our community, and uh, people really eager to be be a part of, of our community it's, so quickly. It's, it's nice to have everybody under the same roof most of the time at night. He's, he's actually not here tonight because of the snow and working in Cincinnati, so he's staying at the old house tonight, but... Uh, <laughs> He, uh, for the most part, will be here every night, which is different than it has been for the last <laughs> six months. So. Oh, that'll be great. Mm. Cats and people all under the same roof. Yes, <laughs> yes, my babies. <laughs> <laughs> all right, are there any other announcements from council? Uh, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, note that Barbara Sandborg from Antioch is asking uh, council to approve, uh, write a letter of approval for a grant and I'm, I'd like it, us to deal with that at this meeting, and I was wondering where would be a good place to do that. Would we Maybe under petitions and communications? Add it. Well, or I, I think maybe under new business, we can, uh, I think that'll give us a little bit more time to, to work okay. through it. Is she here to present this? She is this? here. Okay, great. And, um, she also included a sample letter that we might tweak or write, mm -hmm. and I'll just pass that around, so. Okay. We got, and we got this with an email, right? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. Th this is a, you know, a, some, a letter we might, okay. example of something we would write. So. All right, we'll, we will go ahead and put this item under new business um, since she's here tonight to present and uh, so let me go ahead and add that and uh, I did have one other announcement um, there's a really exciting art opening happening at Village Artisans this Friday the 9th from 6 to 8 it's called views of the village and it is a show that's being done by the YS high school uh, advanced art and AP art classes and this is a big PBL project for them in fact they met with some folks from the village to talk about where they might exhibit and their goals are to basically put on a professional uh, art show and um, raise money for the program and uh, collaborate with other artists so I would highly recommend you check it out this Friday 6 to 8 Village Artisans and, and I have one Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if most of you had a chance to, to see the obituary in the Dayton paper, but uh, Marilyn Dow Dow, oh. uh, a longtime resident of Yellow Springs, she was the uh, treasurer for quite a while for the school board mm -hmm. uh, and, and school system when I was on the school board. And, and her husband, Joe, was uh, past mayor yeah. of uh, Yellow Springs many years ago. So Ms. Washington <coughs> had to... The, the, the paper said there would be a memorial service uh, later on, but just uh, wishing uh, Joe and his family, you know, uh, at least mine and our condolences so to, during this time. She, she passed away on the uh, 31st of uh, December, New Year's. They were here New Year's Eve. recently. Yeah, sure. and Joe was here uh, for the interview. Him, him and Marilyn were here for the interviews for the, the two uh, uh, police candidates and so mm -hmm. forth. So I just thought I'd mention that if folks hadn't seen it. I so. had not. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure we'll be sending them a card um, from council. Um, all right. Are there any announcements that any villagers would like to make? Um, just information for the general good. If you've got things that you want us to discuss, we'll hit it in the agenda um, during citizens' concerns. All right, seeing and hearing none, we will um, go on to the review of minutes from our last meeting. And it looks like there's a slightly updated version of it that's been placed on council desk. I believe from what Judy said, it was typos and such, the, such kind of things that were
corrected hanging, things that were left hanging, little ghosts uh, from old minutes and things like that. So it, um, if you saw something small, um, it may have already been corrected, but uh, we'll go ahead and uh, are there any co other corrections for page one? Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Page six. Page seven. Page eight. Page nine. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, now we will move on to a uh, review of the agenda. Um, I believe that we already decided on the EEF grants. Is there any other changes that need to be made to the agenda as is? Uh, we have a um, application for an HRC alternate to consider. Right. So maybe we can put that under, I guess, new business. Right. And I have a um, I have a new person that I wish to nominate to be a new member of uh, Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. And I just realized, Brian, you asked me to have that on the table, and it isn't, and yours is also not on the table. So. At some point, if I can duck in, I'll just print those. If you feel like you need I think one Aaron, in front I think of Aaron's Aaron's is. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Aaron's I'm is on the table. Um, yeah. You want me to duck in and print get off Susan Stiles' yeah. information? Um, she's. Uh, I've seen it. Yeah, I think it was You've previously in our had previous it, but pack. If anybody feels they need it, Judy will make a copy at some point. Um, but it's it's Susan Stiles' information, which mm -hmm. was in a previous packet. Okay. So we will add uh, HRC and PC nominations. Um, okay, anything else? Any other changes to the agenda? Yeah. Okay. I thought it was, yeah, Brian and I have a brief update regarding work we're doing on standardizing commissions and boards Should that um, be and that could be under old business I think because it I think it is an ongoing okay yep. so commissions and boards thank you Brian. all right anything else okay well let's go ahead and get started um, Petitions and communications. Um, there may be others buried in the mix here, um, but the two that made it into the packet were uh, Dan Tal Daniel Taylor saying um, no to water softening, and Emily Seibel, um, who is the director of Home Inc., gave us an up update on the C Street project that the first home was completed and giving us a sense of how much sort of matching funds that the village's seed money has produced from uh, in the forms of other grants monies going into the into that new home. I did uh, get an email from Emily today who said that the family is in the process of moving into that the first home now. So mm. that's, nice. so that's great. <laughs> All right, um, so I think we can go ahead and move on to public hearings and legislation. Um, the first will be a second reading and public hearing on Ordinance 2015-01. By title or the whole shebang, what would you prefer? Um, I think title only is fine. This is second reading, mm -hmm. um, and it's a pretty <coughs> much a housekeeping method. Me um, housekeeping item okay and the the only change that's been made is that it's been moved up to 2015-01 as opposed to 2014 whatever it was so 2015-01 is an ordinance pursuant to, to section 85 of the village of yellow springs charter to amend the personal personnel policy manual regarding employee health care deductions 
Pat, do you want to give a brief explanation for those who were not here last time? Um, we had <coughs> some part-time employees. The, the um, section of the personnel manual as it applies to deductions for health care uh, were applied unevenly for various reasons. Some employees are under contract. Some employees are hourly employees. Some employees work uh, a different not set schedule but work a specific number of hours every week. This just cleans up the language so that everything in the manual is applied evenly across the board to all employees as it should be right. for equitable equitability reasons. Right. So it's trying to treat, treat all of our employees equally That's and correct. it's at a minimal cost to the village yeah. to make this equitable <coughs> change which is the right thing to do. So. Um, the, the whole text is, of course, available if anybody wants to read it. Um, are there any questions or comments from council? Okay. This is a second, um, second reading and therefore a public hearing, so I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Are there any questions or comments from the public about this item? All right. Seeing and hearing none, I'm going to bring it back to council for a roll call vote. All right. Sims? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Housh? Yes. Asklin? Yes. And I'm sorry, but we forgot to first and second. So we need, just need to do oh. that again. <laughs> we need to do this all over again. My little empty spots. Yeah. I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, this, I don't lead the meetings always. Uh, Karen had a bit of a family emergency, so she's not here tonight to. Uh, so I move to approve ordinance 2015-01. Uh, Second. Okay. We better okay. do that roll call again. All right. Sims? Yes. <laughs> Housh? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Askeland? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now we've done it right. Um, okay. I'm going to try to remember to always get that motion and second this time around. All right. We are now on to uh, resolution 2015-01. All right, this is approving a contract <clears throat> with David Hale for the position of Chief of Police. Whereas the village desires to employ a Chief of Police, and whereas pursuant to Article 4, Section 31 of the, the Yellow Springs Charter, the village manager appoints subordinate officers and employees of the village, and whereas after a comprehensive series of interviews, public presentations, public <coughs> input and comment, and professional testing, the village manager recommends the appointment of David Hale to the position of Chief of Police. And whereas council concurs with the village manager's recommendation that the position of chief of police be offered to David Hale, now therefore the council of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1, council hereby approves the terms of, of the employment agreement or one in a substantially similar form attached to this resolution as Exhibit A to be entered into between the village and David Hale. Section 2, the village manager is hereby authorized and directed to execute the employment agreement or one in a substantially similar form with David Hale on behalf of the village. All right, is there a, a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, our, um, Patty, do you want to say anything about this motion? Um, the contract is uh, the fairly straightforward contract. It's the standard one that has been used by the village for the chief of police position. Um, the um, pay and the benefits are, are li listed and are the same as um, previous chiefs. Actually, the pay is less. Dave, uh, I offered him more money and he said no, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> which uh, is kind of surprising, but um, he did. So um, he, uh, the rest of the terms are, are fairly standard. Okay. So. Great. All right. Um, any questions or comments from council? I'd just like to reiterate how amazing I thought the process was. And uh, I, I think I've said it before, but I really appreciate Patty bringing so many people into uh, the decision-making process, taking the community forum um, to heart and bringing that up as well in that decision-making. Um, so thanks a lot. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'd also like to always open it up to questions or comments from the public. All right, seeing and hearing none, we will go ahead and have a uh, voice vote on this as a resolution. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, the, the ayes carry it. Um, all right, well that moves us on to the next item, which is administering 
the uh, oaths of office to both the assistant village manager, John Young, who is seated, seated up here, and also our chief of police, David Hale, who I think is back here somewhere. <laughs> I solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution and will obey the laws of the United States and of the state of Ohio that I will in all respects observe the provisions of the Charter and Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs and will faithfully discharge the duties and will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Assistant Village Manager. The Office of Assistant Village Manager. I have to have mine on all the time. <laughs> I solemnly swear. I solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. And will obey the laws. And will obey the laws of the United States and the State of Ohio. Of the United States and the State of Ohio. That I will in all respects. That I will in all respects. Observe the provisions of the charter. Observe the provisions of the charter. And ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs. And ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs. And will faithfully discharge the duties. And will faithfully discharge the duties. Of the office of chief of police. Of the office of chief of police. The next item on our agenda is citizens' concerns. This is a place where anybody who has a concern that is not currently on the agenda um, has the ability to come up and share your concerns with us. We ask you to try to keep your comments to three minutes. Um, so if anybody out there has a concern that we are not currently scheduled to discuss, I'm not seeing, oh, yeah. Go ahead, come on up. And we usually ask that when you come up, if you remember to say your name and speak into the microphone, it's helpful for the people at home and for our clerk, but we know you, Joan. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, Joan Edwards. Um, the concern that I have is over the, um, I have to say it, speed trap that is on the west side of the village as you're coming in on Dayton Yellow Springs Road. Um, I was stopped last night coming in about 9.30 at night. I was, the problem is you're coming up a little hill if you're coming in from Dayton, or coming in from Fairborn. You're coming up a little hill and even if you um, stop, if you put your foot off the accelerator, you're still going at least 50 miles an hour probably because that's the speed there and I was clocked at 47 point something coming in and there was a, a police officer sitting there um, the light was green in my direction I put my signal on because I was turning left my habit is to come through that light at coast and by the time if I'm going into town I'm slowing down to the 35 miles an hour by then but unless you put your foot on the brake, you're going to be going more than 35 miles an hour. It's a speed trap. Um, I realize that uh, that's one of the ways that the village can make money. Um, I was only given a warning, but I think we need to review that particular little stretch of road and see whether or not it's reasonable to slow down from 50 to 35 like that. Are you talking about where you're coming in by Antioch Midwest? Yes. yes. That's where you're yeah. talking about? Yeah. Because yeah. you come up a little hill there and in order to come up a hill you're accelerated a little bit and if you you know just put take your foot off the accelerator you're still going more than 35 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So you're expected to put your foot on the brake which is you know a waste of gasoline to begin with um, and uh, slow down from in an instant from highway speed which is 45 to 50 there 
to 35. And uh, I just want to have that reviewed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, any other citizen concerns? Okay. Seeing and hearing none, we will move on to old business. Um, we'll start with the two that are on the agenda, and then we'll add. We'll turn to the commissions and boards that you, um, that Marianne and Brian want to add. Um, so uh, we'll start with the goals review for 2015. I don't know who is going to lead this discussion. I, I have a little bit to say, and I didn't know Karen wasn't going to be here. I know. I was um, it, was, it was quite suggest, unexpected. I, I mean, I, I, I looked at our 2014 strategic goals, mm -hmm. and as, some, as we noted at the last meeting, there are some of the goals that have been completed. Actually, I think the first two, basically. Mm -hmm. And a number of the others are ongoing, are in process. But as I was looking at them, it seems to me some of these could be legitimately called goals. Mm -hmm. Others are more really, I think, fit into the principles and values that we have, which I, I'd asked uh, Judy to, to print out those value statements, which right. I think are great value statements. But I was. I was interested in taking this and sort of trying to organize it into what I thought were actual goals and say completed or not, goals that are in process, and <coughs> some of the things that re really aren't goals, I don't think, mm -hmm. like uh, well, this, um, well, I'm not seeing it <laughs> coming up. Oh, increase effectiveness of community deliberations. That, that, that's that's a, a way we want to operate, I think. I don't think it's a goal. So yeah. I would be interested in sort of working with this, with someone, with another council member. I, was I think that would be a great idea. Um, Shall I contact Karen? Yeah, I think that would be good. I think if you and Karen could just work through these and add um, any other goals that the council um, has, I think for me, um, our primary goal needs to be to really work hard on our budget mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. really the fiscal responsibility part of our our um, our value system. So that's really the the primary <coughs> goal that I see us really needing to focus on, um, both in terms of our revi our um, special revenue funds and in terms of our general fund. Um, maybe we can just kind of go around the table with any well as, as as part of that I'd like to, to also see that uh, we at least review the, the budget and our expenses on a quarterly basis mm -hmm. since the budget is so tight and not wait till the end of the, 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 end of the year when we're doing the budget so mm -hmm. that we'll, we'll have an idea of where we need to go or what we might be needing to do as we progress through this year Mm -hmm. And if we need to, to make adjustments, then yeah. we should do it then and not not mm -hmm. try to throw it in at the very end. Yes. Just, just a suggestion. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's a great, that's great, that's great, great suggestion. Um, it, it seems to me that we need to articulate uh, our goal related to the um, water plant a little bit more specifically. Um, the second goal mentions completing the water sourcing yeah. analysis, but you know I think now we're beyond that yeah. piece. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight is I think when we went over these goals at our retreat last year, we understood that many of these were not going to be completed in one year. You know, I, I mean, many of these take some time, um, and we have so many things going on. So a lot of these goals, I, I just like, you know, I sort of marked, looks like we're halfway through or so, and, and we've got to complete that work. Um, also, I'm not sure we ever formally said yes to that all is, of That these. is true, right? We Some of them. kind of just included everything. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're great initiatives. Um, and I guess the other thing uh, that I would like to see is uh, a, a more specific articulation of how we're going to approach economic development. Um, and now that we've got John in the mix, uh, and I, I imagine that 
Karen and yourself will be able to just kind of work on that. So we do have um, on the second page, but I think that now that the, uh, the CVE is off the table, we need to be thinking about what we're doing next because several of the goals mentioned that. So. Okay. Do you have anything else you want to add? No, I, I did think of maybe taking maybe taking some things and actually pushing them out, either taking them sort of off being active and maybe pushing mm -hmm. them, not, not, not omitting them, but um, putting them down further because there's so many of them. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. yeah. And we know that things come up that we don't even know about now. So just trying to be more realistic, like, I guess, what I want to say is prioritizing things like yes. clearly uh, the budget and economic development and the water plant are big priorities and some of these other things are not as much of a priority. Well and the water plant can actually be combined with the completion of the bottleneck elimination right. and the loop completion. Yes. I mean that's all, all part are. of the water system mm -hmm. and, and those three projects will get the entire system up to date. So work on those as a goal you know uh -huh. in entirety okay. yeah, and, and along with that I'd, l I'd like to see us at least semi-annually look at the goals yes to I see think on a quarterly you know, basis as well yeah. e e either way but at least <laughs> not wait until the, wait the, the end of the year. year to see yeah. how well we did yeah so. it's a good idea to put it on our July calendar we were hoping to maybe start having a some kind of access calendar that we could all access would help us to remember to do things like that. We could maybe create a community Google calendar that I tried. Yeah, you know, it's what we got, John. For. <laughs> and it will be a lot easier with the new website. Okay. So mm -hmm. I think that's going to make a big difference. There was one, uh, I remember at the last meeting, a citizen uh, asked whether citizens can have input into the goal. Absolutely, that was going to be. And I don't know how we would want to do that. I mean, clearly they can, at, at this point right now, I'm sure we could open it up to the public. And <coughs> I, I don't know if there are other ways that would make sense to do well, that. Well, since, you know, you and, and you're going to get with, uh, with Karen, Karen. Uh, you know, citizens, can send either one of you an yes. email on mm -hmm. and suggest to yeah. go. And, and, and the other thing on that, I, th I think w we as council have to step up. The, the, the last set of goals and activities, one person's name was on a lot of them, and it kind of gave the, gave the uh, if a layman was looking at it, it kind of gave the impression that the other council members weren't really back and then the, the goal of the work. But mm -hmm. I think we all should, you know, once it's finalized, uh, take, take an active role in saying, yes, I'm going to mm -hmm. to follow this goal right. to uh, see that it's, that it's done or at least make a re report back on it versus, you know, dropping it on one person because, it, you know, it, I, I think we all need to be involved in, in what we plan on accomplishing. So. Okay, and Judy, you have the Excel spread. Do you have the spreadsheet? I mean, electronic. Um, I have this in a PDF from Karen. She put the she put this. I think she, yes, Karen, yes. Karen has it. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Okay, um, I'd like to open it up to any citizens if you've got any thoughts that you want to share right now. Otherwise, you know, ponder these things and uh, share them in email with us. Um, not seeing anybody leaping up to uh, share some goals that they'd like the village to accomplish. So we'll uh, take this as our first uh, real discussion of it, uh, preliminary discussion, and we'll have a, a bigger discussion when uh, Marianne and Karen are able, uh, have been able to get together and, uh, and, uh, and think about them at that time. All right. Um, the next item is the Charter Review Committee discussion of the charge. And um, we have some notes from John Chambers that uh, apply to the charge for the CRC 
in 2006. Um, and the letter that he wrote um, saying, uh, well, I'm just going to read parts of his letter so people are very clear about what the Charter Review Committee will do. Um, this letter will discuss the task before you and the process for achieving that task. The state of Ohio Constitution allows municipalities like the village of Yellow Springs to adopt a charter covering certain items of governance for the village. This charter acts as a mini constitution for the village. As with all constitutional amendments, changes to the village charter should only be made when they are truly needed. The Charter Review Committee has been asked by council to take the following steps. Identify existing problems with the charter, identify solutions for those existing problems, draft language to resolve the problems, approve the language, submit the language to council for review, recommend the changes to the voters, and support your changes to the voters during the election process. Um, we recommend that the committee, during its initial meeting, select a chairperson, vice chairperson, a secretary, clerk of council, in this case it will be Judy Kintner, will act as support staff to the committee and will attend the meetings. Um, we will recommend that the committee will establish a timeline and meeting schedule and hope that the entire project can be accomplished within a matter of se several months and they'll be asked to review issues identified by staff, to meet with staff and the village solicitor and other officials, identify other issues, finalize the language, and meet with council regarding the proposed language. So that's the, the heart of what the charter review process is. And I believe that Brian and Jerry were in charge of uh, collecting and interviewing people. Yeah, and Where are we at? Well, we're, we uh, should start the interviews next week. Okay. Uh, We've uh, got a number of folks that have you know, we talked to that have expressed an interest. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I believe we <coughs> we got one more applicant got, right uh, at the end of the year, year right? Right. Yep. So uh, okay. we plan on um, calling them and setting up interviews, <coughs> and uh, we should be able to come back at the next meeting with a slate, uh, with, with a slate of uh, candidates. To, to, to approve. Uh, of course, the standing members would, would be the <coughs> village manager, uh, the clerk, and uh, uh, the solicitor. And, and our, <coughs> our feeling was that uh, since we're going to be interviewing uh, at the, the end of the month, mm -hmm. that we would prefer <coughs> to start the process with the new solicitor versus the old. And if the old were to change, mm -hmm. then bringing the new up to speed. Okay. So, and, um, and the only thing that I would caution about is the timeline. Correct. Um, because <coughs> you do have to have any changes uh, if they're going to go on the ballot. Um, you have to have those to the Board of Elections by August. Correct, Judy? Yep. The ballot for November. For November. Okay. It could go on a ballot for May? It could. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just the timing thing as to, you know, if you wait for the new solicitor, it would be probably March before you could start. Right, and, and I think we said we could have some preliminary meetings right. to Correct. to get Correct. things rolling. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were pretty excited. We got um, by my count, I think we're up to eight applicants, right. and um, our our plan is to at the next meeting on the twentieth, I believe it is, uh, to bring forth our recommendations for approval, and um, I think we can start some meetings in February. Um, does this letter seem to be um, it, it, what it, yeah it seems to, to follow what we, we had initially when we talked about uh, going out uh, requesting uh, uh, applicants or persons of interest and at least that's I've been kind of mm -hmm. following that one when I talk to folks so I, I right. don't I don't see any anything different in here than what we've been you been may want right. when you do the interviews you may want to see if you can find somebody or more perhaps more than one person who's willing to think of themselves as a chair or vice correct, chair so correct. that you can kind of have, have that, that so you have make sure you've got somebody who's willing to say yes I will make that commitment right. um, and maybe the secretary also because ta they would be taking minutes is that the it says that the clerk will be there as support, but the implication, if you've got a secretary, is that there will be somebody taking minutes. Is that 
how you understand well, actually, that. Well, I, I was curious about that piece in particular, is why the recommendation was to have chair, vice chair, and secretary. Well, I think it, it's more <coughs> the minutes for that charter review committee, just looking back at what had been done previously, it's really very targeted. It's not, mm -hmm. not a lot of detail. It's We discussed this section. These were the recommendations made. Here, are the, Here's the draft. Right. It's it's not a then she said, then he said. Yeah, we that, discussed the difference between. Yeah, that's the way I looked at it's it. Just it's just very, just, here are know, the changes for today. If, if, and then the right. clerk is tasked with getting that into a form, getting it back out to the committee, facilitating right. the next meeting, sort of roles like that. Right, so the language of the charter would would almost have to go through the solicitor because they might say, we, this is a change we want to make. Mm -hmm. Yes. But yes. lay people probably can't right. very easily come up with right. that. <laughs> and then any change has to, most of them have to, again, be checked against the Ohio Revised yeah. Code, right. which right. the solicitor would need to do, yeah. Right, okay. <coughs> Um, well, that sounds good. Um, I think this letter can probably just be updated and be kind of ready to go out when the slate of candidates is published. And, 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 and I kind of had some of the same concerns that, that Patty has in terms of the, of the, of the timeline. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I don't know about Brian, but if, if we look at it and if we feel we can't, won't be able to meet that timeline, we will certainly come back to council immediately and say, hey, we can't meet that timeline. We need to you know, extend it if that's the case. So. Yeah. I, I mean, it's not urgent. It'd be nice to get it all done by November, but if it has to wait until May, it's, uh, that's, that's just the way it, the way it rolls. Um, are there any uh, questions or concerns from anybody else on council first? Um, any questions or concerns about the charter review process from people in the village? All right, seeing and hearing none, we will move on to items, uh, the next item of old business, which is commissions and board. Marianne and Brian had a timeline process that they wanted to present. Yeah, um, yeah Brian and I met and talked about um, standardizing to the degree that it makes sense com how commissions are put together and how they run um, and uh, we created a timeline Brian which you have in front of you um, and uh, our our thought is uh, we're going to um, write up a draft for roles and responsibilities of uh, commissions bring it to village council to review, add to, and then also have all of the commissions look at that draft and have input into that draft and then bring that back to council. Then the other piece is the standardization. Um, for example, does uh, the council liaison vote or not vote? You know, what some commissions yes, some commissions no. Uh, what are the length of terms? Those kind of things. Standardizing that where it makes sense to do so. And again, bring it to council, look at it, bring it to the commissions to review. And then so uh, by the second meeting in March, if things sort of move as uh, the timeline shows it, then we would adopt the new roles and responsibilities and whatever changes to the ordinance. Um, and, and one of the things we discussed, um, so, some things are sort of easy, they're straightforward, but some things are not easy. And um, one thing that is not easy, um, that I think we've had differing opinions on council and differing opinions within the commissions is, what is the role of the of individual commission members and commissions in regard to working with staff? Um, can, do, do, does a commission need to have council approval before its members go to staff? Uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of things can uh, commission members just go to staff for? Um, and then if they're going to, if a commission member is going to staff, should the council liaison do that? Um, clearly, I think we should always go to the village manager first. But th this is an area that there are differing opinions on. Mm -hmm. 
and it's possible it makes a difference depending on the commission. I, I don't know. I mean, for example, planning commission frequently works with the, the, the zoning person and um, th there's a standard there that isn't, doesn't apply to the other commissions. Um, then the other question that we looked at was should uh, commission members be held to a certain standard of conduct? Um, if a commission, uh, someone is appointed to a commission, they've been appointed for some reason, representing some interests, some skills, some interests. And so in the community, what are some, what's their responsibility in the community? Um, can they, uh, for example, uh, say, well, I'm on this commission, therefore I think we should do X, Y, or Z? Uh, no, probably not. <laughs> um, so that's another question that there are differ differing opinions about, and we wanted to involve council and people on the commissions as we looked at that. Okay. So I guess one thing is uh, we wanted to make sure that this process looks good. Uh, it, it was actually a recommendation of Karen's to kind of lay it out because um, I do feel very strongly that we sh should complete this work. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. should get these ordinances in line and also I know the commission members uh, want a little bit more guidance from us. Um, so do you guys see any hitches? Was it? Okay. Go for it. Okay, great. All right. Is that it for that item? Do you need anything else from us? No. Okay. Great. Okay. So now we're going to move to new business. And the first item of new business, which I suspect many people are here for, is the community solar project power proposal discussion. This is being brought to us by Mary Ann McQueen and the environment, uh, the energy board, sorry. Yeah. And uh, it looks like Dan is going to set up a PowerPoint. No. Um, do you want to introduce Yeah, that? yeah. yeah um, Dan? I'd like to introduce Dan and um, also um, any other uh, Energy Board Commission members. Would you stand up so people can see? I see Eric Johnson, Rick Walkie, Jerry Papania. Dan Rudolph is going to be making the presentation. And um, I, before Dan starts, I just want to say that um, I had requested that uh, Judy put the values of or the values that council is going by on our table and the fifth value uh, is seek in all our decisions and actions to reduce the carbon footprint of the community and encourage sound ecological practices throughout. So as the Energy Board has been looking at how to do that, how to decrease the carbon footprint, the concept of a community solar project came up. It's been uh, discussed at the Energy Board and the Board wanted to bring it to Council to uh, educate Council about this and then to look at what might need to be done to be able to move this forward. Okay. Out of the way here. No, I think that's good. Okay. So uh, I'm Danny Goff. I'm a member of the Energy Board for the year. Um, I've lived in Yellow Spring for 20 years, and um, I'm an electrical engineer. Also, just to let you know, I'm not personally on the board, so the things I'm proposing. You might want to use else. the use the microphone. It's a little hard to hear you. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you can speak a little bit more directly into it, I think that'll be helpful to us. Okay. So okay. Um, so what I'm talking about today is community solar. So just first of all, a definition of what community solar is. Uh, community solar enables people who don't have rooftops or land suitable for solar panels to be able to invest in and reap the rewards of solar panels installed at a suitable location uh, within the same utility. So essentially, you've got a solar field, kind of like any other solar field, but individuals get the benefit from that solar field. And I'll talk about more in detail about exactly how that works. But there's three general 
models that are, there's more than three, but there's three typical models that um, we took a look at as what would uh, work in Yellow Springs. And I've listed the, the pros and cons. I'm not going to go into this great detail with this. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. But the first model is utility owned. The pros on that is that if utility like Yellow Springs utility owned a community solar project, they could sell the SREX. But SREX are our solar renewable energy credits. And that's a free market way of promoting renewable energy. So they're worth money on the open market. Um, if laws mandate that power plants are produce a certain amount of renewable energy, instead of actually doing it, power plants can purchase S SREX and say, okay, I'm, I'm producing energy because I've supported renewable energy. So they have some kind of, of worth. They're not worth quite as much in Ohio as other states because the Ohio legis legislature has uh, sort of uh, softened the uh, renewable energy programs in Ohio, but they are worth something. The cons of utility-owned uh, community solar is that there's a large upfront cost, and that's that's the, the big one that stands out. Is that you essentially the village would have to fund the solar array. There's no tax benefits for the village owning a, a solar array, and the village has to do all the administration, all the maintenance, everything. Else. <coughs> okay. Second type of community solar is a special energy a spe special entity that does a power purchase agreement with a someone else. And someone else could be individuals, but typically it's a single entity. And an example of that is the Antioch Solar Array, the Glass Farm Project that didn't get completed. Uh, that is a power purchase agreement. What a power purchase agreement is, is the purchaser of the energy agrees to buy energy over the next long term, say 20 years, and at a particular rate. And in, uh, institutional type investors invest and put the solar panels in at a guaranteed rate of return. So they get a certain percentage back on their money for funding this whole thing. The institution, for example, Antioch gets electricity from the solar panels at a certain rate, and the maintenance is taken care of by the whole system. The pros on this are, again, you can sell the SREX. Uh, <laughs> typically, they go to the investors. Uh, there are tax advantages for the investors also. But again, these are big, you know, um, fund type investors that do this sort of thing. The, uh, the cons are, especially for what we're looking at here in Yellow Springs, is that you have to find institutional investors that would be willing to work in such a small scale. Typically, they want a larger scale. Typically, they will want, and this is a real key thing, one customer that signs the power purchase. And so for this type of model to work, essentially you'd have to come up with one customer, whether it be the village or some other entity that would agree to buy the power for a long period of time uh, without, you know, and be able to support that. Um, the other thing is that is required, and we saw that in the Antioch installation, it, in order for the, the investors to make the money they want on this in order to, to become involved, the only installation that works well is ground mount in land that's already owned. You can't incur any other expenses. We talked about that during the Indian <laughs> Solar Array, putting things on roofs, putting things um, as far as carports and stuff like that do not work in this model because the investors require all the, the profit to be able to make this work. So the final one, and this is the one that we're going to talk about today, is a special purpose entity where you have individually owned panels. So what we're talking about is a solar field, but people would actually own particular panels in that solar field. So the benefits of this is, again, you can sell SREX, but individuals typically don't have the way of doing that. So the way that, that this would typically be run is the entity that oversees the maintenance on the array would sell the SREX and use that to pay for the maintenance of the panels on the, uh, at the solar farm. Because the individuals actually own the panels, you can take a 30% tax write-off for at least the next two years. Just like having them on your roof, the IRS has ruled that having remotely mounted 
panels and virtual net metering allows you to take that 30% tax write-off. Um, you can also support smaller scale solar installations. If you're going to have panels on your roof and get a professional company to install them, the, the overhead of them coming out and installing an inverter and all the wiring and the permits and the approvals and all that, you really have to have a certain level of panels with a solar field where you have a bunch of panels and it's all administrated and installed by one overseeing body, you can buy one panel. You could buy another panel six months from now or a year from now and you can afford it. You can buy two or three now, two or three later. It, there's no restriction on that. It's up to whatever we decide right now in the ordinance, it's up to the maximum amount of energy you actually use in your house. This also would allow renters to participate. So right now, you have to put your, typically landlords don't like people installing things on their roofs. I mean, theoretically a renter could install solar panels on the roof of whatever place they're renting. But in this case, a renter could own solar panels and if they move to a different rental property within the village electric system, they still would get the benefit. You know, it's just a matter of changing, just like changing their electrical service, changing where their energy generated by the solar panels go. It's a scalable project, so it can start out small, and if we decide in the future that there's more room in our energy budget for more locally generated power, it can be scaled. The cons are we have to have something called virtual net metering. Um, virtual net metering means that you've got a meter that's on the solar uh, field and a meter on your house you know the amount of energy the entire solar field generates. You know how many panels you own. You divide the entire energy by the number of panels. That's your energy. It gets subtracted off of your electric meter reading on your house. So it requires that, and it requires the billing software to be able to handle that modification. Okay. So why do we want to do this? I mean, what is the reasoning behind going down this path? Well, you know, number one is climate change. Um, it's unlikely with the uh, progression of the, what the Ohio government has done so far lately uh, and what uh, the attitudes are of the people in office in Ohio, that there'll be any significant environmental legislation in the future in Ohio. Uh, one could say the same thing as the, the United States. Um, You've got to wonder whether or not there'll be any significant progress towards dealing with one climate change anytime in the at least near future. So if it's not going to come from top down, it's not going to be legislated from top down, it needs to happen bottom up. So this is a very small piece of an overall vision that hopefully Yellow Springs will become a green carbon neutral um, Village. So, since it can't happen from the top down, it needs to happen from the bottom up. There are many other things. This is just a small piece. Um, we have stated in the past that this is really important to Yellow Springs. Uh, from the Comprehensive Plan of 2010, this is a quote Being environmentally responsible, working to improve and preserve the natural ecosystem's health, is deemed higher priority than individual or collective economic gain. And it's also from the same plan. Conservation, be it applied to the natural environment as a whole, or resources such as air, water, and energy, is more than a concept in Yellow Springs. Village government should lead and support programs and practices that conserve energy and reduce, if not avoid, contaminating our air and water. And also from the ordinance that established the Energy Board, which I'm a member of, in concert with the Village Council's current goal to develop a comprehensive policy that addresses global warming and seeks to reduce the carbon footprint of our community, the Energy Board is charged to work in concert with the village staff to advise council. So we said all these, th these things, let's go ahead and do them. And I was talking to somebody about this presentation and what we're trying to do here the other day, and they put a, a really vivid image in our mind about, you know, my question was, why are we not doing anything about climate change? Why, why is the, the United States, the carbon emissions are going up, not down? And the record high this last year. Why are we not doing anything at all? And she said, well, 
it's probably like a, uh, a frog in a, in a pot of water. It keeps getting hotter, you don't notice it. You just keep trying to delude yourself that it's not getting hotter. It's not really getting hotter. We're not going to cook. Here we are. Okay. Um, a couple of years ago, we passed a net metering ordinance that allowed a certain percentage of the village power to be generated uh, for local solar and wind projects. That was 5% of the total uh, energy portfolio of Yellow Springs. It was broken up to, into two different sections, large ener energy generator projects, which exceeded 25 kilowatts. We set aside 4% of the village energy budget for that. Uh, pretty much the Antioch North Hall and um, golf course projects used up that 4%. So we've got 1% that was a set aside for small generators of under 25 kilowatts. So that gives about 250 kilowatts total, 250,000 kilowatts total. Um, and some just quick estimates of doing an inventory of what is installed. We estimate that there's less than 50 kilowatts totally installed in the village. Um, and that's of the under 25 kilowatt combined solar. So what, why have we not used up the 1%? Why have not more people installed solar panels? Um, so there's a lot of interest in town. You can see by all the people here, the room is full. Uh, but why, uh, why didn't more of the 1% used up? We've only used a fifth of it. Um, the main problems seem to be uh, suitable rooftops. You have to have a rooftop that with shingles of 25 year life, typically 1,000 square feet to get the minimum size array. You need unshaded. The whole idea of cutting down trees to then install solar panels to try to reduce climate change doesn't seem like a, a good thing. Um, you've got to have an optimal tilt of 30 degrees to get the maximum benefit out of the solar panels. Solar panels up front costs are very high to actually put enough panels on your house to provide all of your electrical energy that way. If you're a landlord or a, um, a renter, um, typically your landlord is not going to let you make modifications to the structure. Um, even then, if you decide to move to a different place, you can't sell them, easily sell them, or take them with you. Okay, so this is the, the one thing, I want, one slide that hopefully everybody at least got my hand out or, or something, or can see this, that I really want to talk about. This is what we are proposing, the Energy Board is pro proposing that we do for convenient solar. So we have a array of solar panels that can be, it can be a solar field like the Antioch solar field. It can be uh, solar awnings. I don't know if anybody's seen the Assurance building up uh, on the 70s and see their entire parking lot is covered with uh, uh, solar awnings that cover all the parking places and they've got a 2.4 megawatt solar array up there. And they get to park under uh, cover and not have to scrape their windshields. So, you know, why not? Why not put solar awnings up over parking lots? Why not use uh, flat roofs that aren't used for anything else? Why not use areas of open fields that are not used for anything else. So it, it can be in one place, it can be in multiple places. Um, but the key thing I want to point out is that the panels are owned by individual people or businesses. So they're, they're owned by one person. It, the energy that's produced by those the entire array is metered and then the meter is divided by the total number of panels to figure out how much each person's panel is generated. Um, according to our ordinance right now, solar can be up, solar or wind can provide up to 100% of your present electrical bill. Um, you would have a separate entity that we could call Yellow Springs Community Solar LLC that would operate, maintain, and it would also could be a place to broker panel exchange. In other words, if you're moving out of town and you want to sell your panels, you don't have to rip them off your roof to sell them. You can sell them to somebody else here in town. Um, so the energy put on the grid is metered. It would then be via software subtracted from people's energy bills. Um, 
Right now, at least in what we estimated the, the uh, usage in town, we've got about 200 kilowatts left over. This can lend uh, to another model where we also additionally have a lending fund. So we have some other way of lending money to people. So instead of paying electric bills, they can make payments on a solar panel. Uh, and over time pay off that and then own those solar panels. That's a, an additional step and we'd have to have enough uh, interest in the whole thing. Okay, so what are some of the benefits of having uh, this array and renewable community solar in Yellow Springs? Um, one really nice benefit is if we do a 200 kilowatt project there's an opportunity, uh, the, the uh, grid providers, the other energy companies are always trying to do load balancing. And to do that, they try to promote battery installations along the solar panels. And they will actually, on big solar installations, provide those battery backup systems for free. So what happens is, is during normal load fluctuations those batteries are called in to help support the grid during power outages a benefit to the village is that becomes a that a battery backup system that then could if it was if the solar arrays were sited near some big building could then be some kind of emergency shelter so that is a a free benefit uh, of at least a reasonably large scale installation. We're serving multiple people with one solar installation, so we have economies of scale. Doing a big array, a lot of panels, is much cheaper than doing five on one person's house. You don't have to buy all the inverters. You don't have to you could buy the same racking, the same system. Um, Off-site solar is more easily sold, so if people need, are moving out of town, they need to sell it. I already mentioned that. Uh, the tilt and orientation of the panels can be optimal uh, so you can get the best output. It would prevent uh, approximately 165 metric tons of CO2 <coughs> annually released in the atmosphere which is equivalent to 140 acres of mature forest. Uh, so it's equivalent to planting 140 acres of forest and letting it mature for 50 years. So, and it's a fast way to fulfill the 1%. The idea here was when we set aside this 5% for solar and wind was to actually use it all. I mean, we didn't set it aside to maybe sometime in the future when people felt like it. It was to try to get um, all of that utilized. So the, we need to do this just because we need to move on climate change and also, at least right now, uh, the tax credit, the 30% tax credit that makes this reasonably affordable uh, expires in two years. So we've got to do it before it expires. I don't know. I don't know whether it will be renewed or not, but it may not. Okay, so last page. Okay, so that's community solar in a nutshell. What needs to happen? So the first thing that needs to happen is we need council to, to get uh, to direct staff to do an inventory of all the installed solar. We did a, a inventory of all the solar that we know about, but you know it needs to be an official inventory. <coughs> um, council needs to direct village staff to work with uh, Courtney and Associates and if need be the village solicitor to resolve any outstanding questions as far as the way a ordinance would need to be phrased. There are lots of examples of uh, net metering ordinances. In fact, in uh, Vermont, New York, Washington, D.C., and California, the state-by-state -state law mandates that all utilities need to support virtual net metering. Um, Ohio is not quite as progressive as those states, but the Village of Yellow Strings, because we own our own utility, can be that progressive. And the third thing is to try to come up with a reasonable rate structure for community solar. So we're cognizant and the people who are uh, promoting this are cognizant of the fact that the village needs to support the electrical grid and needs to, and we need to pay for that. Solar is only valuable when the sun is out. 
when the sun is not out, we're relying on the, the village grid. We need to pay for that. So I live outside the village. My lines and connection are supplied by dp &L. I buy my energy from someone else. So a line charge or something that supports the infrastructure is perfectly reasonable. And what we're proposing is that, a, that let's say you produced uh, 100 100 percent of the power you produce 90 percent of it gets credited to the individual 10 percent goes to the village that's just a, a random number out of the blue we need to work with uh the staff and john courtney to try to figure out what that number would be to make it reasonable um, there is some cost to upgrade the software the proposed project the cost would be merged into the actual uh, installation of the panels. So the people who bought the panels, it would be part of the cost of their panels. The, the quote that we got was two, $2,000 to actually do the change to the, the billing software. Uh, so it's not a huge amount of money and it doesn't add that much to each person's expenditure on the panels. Um, we also understand that there is a loss of revenue to the village. Uh, they calculated using the same numbers that looking at the Antioch solar array, we calculated that would be about $3,000 a year in revenue that the village makes on selling electricity. Um, we, you know, that is again something that can be negotiated. You could make money on people having solar panels in a, vir in a, a virtual net metering type uh, community solar project also. Uh, at a certain point, too many costs make the cost of the solar panels too high and the whole project too high. So the, the idea is that hopefully the village supports this sort of green local energy generation and will support it by making it not too costly. So the final thing is after you go through this is to actually develop a virtual net metering uh, addendum to the renewable energy generation ordinance that would allow this. And there are many models, uh, many examples uh, in Vermont and New York and California <coughs> of how that language for this is. So it's not something we have to reinvent from scratch. Okay. So. All right. Thank you. Um, well, I <coughs> think uh, I was going to, uh, uh, well, first, thank the Energy Board for all the work that went into that presentation. I appreciate your efforts. Um, I do want to give um, Patty and staff, I know Patty has contacted John Courtney. Is he here? John tonight? is here. Okay. And John right. A. Burns is also here. Because um, I think they do have some concerns. Is this memo from? That is from John Courtney. Okay. Um, and so, um, Maybe uh, Patty you could just uh, take over with the staff um, uh, initial thoughts about this. Um, yeah, let me. The first thing I want to say is I am not opposed to this project in principle. I think in principle this is a great idea. I just have concerns for the village. Um, in my role as village manager, um, that if this is something that council wants to pursue, it has to be done right. And I think John Courtney will bear, uh, bear that out in that, you know, anything like this, you have to be very, very specific about how you're going to change your ordinance and the wording and how you approach it. Um, I do have a couple of, I guess, I don't, I don't want to use the word, I dispute Dan's figures, but I, I I'm not sure that your 50 kilowatt hour is, is accurate. I know Johnny, um, where are you at, Johnny? Um, I know you were working on that today to try to get <clears throat> a more accurate number. Do you, can you tell me where? It's in the 60s, but that's without me going to uh, seven other properties. And the unlicensed morning, ones? I found one this morning that's not even on our system. So as far as that we knew about. So I gotta actually make contact with that homeowner to find out what's going on there. So you were at 60 just off of the interconnectivity Correct. agreement list, Correct. and we have seven other properties that are not even on that list. Are, are you including North Hall Antioch? I don't know. You took that. I took that 
the, that's the 50 yeah this that one was taken out so the biggest concern I have number one is that we do not have an accurate inventory of what we have because we have folks out there who are putting these solar arrays on their properties they're getting a permit from the building department in Greene County but that's all they're getting they're not coming to the village they're not having them inspected they're not we don't know what they're generating um, Johnny do you want to explain that part of it since you're, you've been trying to track <coughs> I've been playing like detectives over the last month or so, but uh, I ran across the one this morning by accident. I went to look at the uh, water main break that happened on Friday, and as I was driving through the cloud, I noticed it on top of the roof. Uh, so therefore, I come back, check our records. I actually contacted the county. They have no records of it. So they didn't even get a building permit they from the county. Uh, and the three that I know of from another company in Cincinnati got a building permit. But that's as far as they went. They never got no inspections. And that was in 2012. So we're still trying to get all of the paperwork from that company. I did talk to them this morning. They are supposed to fill out the paperwork and then try to get them inspected. But what happened with them, what we found out who the one company was, is they called to get an interconnection agreement because they already got solar. Mm -hmm. And because their solar was, uh, they had put a, uh, 4kw inverter in there they only had money to put 2kw panels up there so they added on to it when they got enough money so that made me go back and look at some of our interconnection agreements and some of them are like 2.75 but they have a capability of being at six because the inverter is at six so you have to size what we have for the largest amount because they can because go they can add, add on to it well, but they could change the inverter too. There's no. They way can. To you, if, if, like, this building's got a 1200 amp service on it, we're only using 800, but by code, you have to size it for 1200 because you can add on to it. You could, you could, yeah, you can go ahead and sure, turn it out. But the, as far as your county, you can only go by the, the number. Of I have to go by the maximum amount per the county. And, and I've talked to the inspector today, and he says, just like, if he was going to do the Antioch system, they can't install 500 kW and be rated at 1,000 because you could go back and add it right to it. You can always take it out, but you would have to change that main component. And then if you change that main component, then you could come back to the village and say, hey, by the way, I went down to three, so can you change my I think the language footprint. in the ordinance is the amount of energy they actually generate, not the amount of energy could generate well they can all generate that maximum amount if they yeah. can put it on we'll, the we'll, property we'll have to right. we'll yeah. have to resolve sure. this it clearly yeah. Yeah. i think the point is sure. that this is a complexity that we have Absolutely. to right uh, it, deal with we have to we have to have an accurate inventory i mean the 60 that that johnny is sure about as far as interconnectivity agreements that's 17 properties is that seven I think it was 17 and we, now we have seven or eight more so we're back again at half of that again so now we're at a thousand you know or a thousand a hundred so um, you know we we don't know what's out there and he's finding more of them every day the other concern that I have is some of the long-term commitments that the village has financially in some of our contracts and that's why John Courtney is here um, because we have 50 and 60 year agreements in hydroelectric plants that are getting ready to go online. One of the questions I think we did get answered um, from John was the legalities of allowing somebody else to transmit over our grid. And he did say that as long as it was worded correctly in the ordinance, if this were something that were to go forward, that he thought that that would be acceptable. He talked to the AMP uh, council and that it could be worded in a way that it could be limited to the community solar and we wouldn't have to the concern was would we have to let other providers then transmit over our grid mm -hmm. um, and we think that we have that answered correct john maybe yeah. maybe uh, john should just come up and and uh priest <laughs> yep <laughs> um first off just uh 
Yeah. Um, just Maybe. to echo what uh, what Patty said, because I know at the energy uh, board meeting, uh, some people may have left here thinking I'm somehow anti-solar, and I'm not. Uh, I'm very much in support of solar. I've got a lot of clients that are involved in solar projects right now, so uh, so I'm definitely not anti-solar. Uh, but what I am, and, and what my charge is working for you as a consultant, is to make sure that projects like this don't adversely affect the village's electric system or its other customers who may not want to participate in a project like this. And as I explained at the Energy Board, that's really my charge, uh, is to make sure that if you decide to, to go forward with this type of project, that it works and it doesn't create some sort of adverse effect on the electric system of the village or, or the village as a whole or other customers of the village. So uh, as Patty said, um, and, and by the way, I was involved when you developed these 4% and 1% limits uh, a few years ago, um, which really was kind of generated by the, you know, Antioch wanting to put in a large solar project. And so at the time, uh, <coughs> Consul and the, uh, and the village manager wanted us to take a look at your existing portfolio. Uh, the village gets its power from a number of different resources, most of which are already green renewable resources. In fact, in 2016, the village will get about 80 percent, excuse me, about 60 percent of its energy from hydroelectric resources, about 20 percent from wind, uh, about uh, Three percent from uh, from <coughs> excuse me from landfill gas uh, and the balance about seven percent from a natural gas fire plant that you're involved with and the and the balance basically from the market so uh, and so our concern was was making sure that we didn't have the village uh, you know losing load to in, in the case of Antioch or other behind the meter generators uh, and causing them to be in a situation where now they've got Commit, commitments to more resources than they need, and they're turning around having to sell that power to the marketplace, likely at a lower price than what they're paying for, a la causing power costs to go up here in the village. So, so that's what developed or, or generated the four percent limit on on the larger <coughs> units. And unfortunately, Antioch, as was indicated uh, by Dan, pretty much gobbled that up uh, with their project. But for smaller projects, mainly residential uh, or small commercial. Um, the set aside was 1% to allow uh, at least some opportunity there for residential and commercial customers to install behind the meter solar or wind generation uh, to meet part of their needs. So, so that's how those numbers, you know, came about. And and you say, well, geez, you got 10%. Why couldn't we make those numbers bigger? Well, the, you know, we're only using up five of it. Well, the problem is you could lose load just by fact of losing load. And if you were around when Antioch College closed uh, not too many years ago. Uh, and you've lost some industrial load at the same time. You've seen a reduction in your load, and you're actually are using less now than you were obviously uh, several years ago. So, so that's where the one percent and the four percent come from. Uh, I think you've got a list of what some of our concerns are uh, with regard or issues and concerns that we have with this project. And again, not opposed to the concept, uh, but certainly we want to make sure that it doesn't create some other problems for the village's electric system. In particular, probably the biggest one is. Uh, uh, that we don't end up getting a situation where the village has to provide a similar service to other suppliers of electricity. As I said, you're pretty well locked up into your, into your resource needs, uh, and that could have some detrimental effect. One of the things we heard at the presentation at the Energy Board uh, was that these panels would be owned by, or the project would be owned by residential customers, you know, residents of uh, Yellow Springs. And that really takes away some of that concern that we do have, because if we, if we can limit it that way so that it's not, you know, company XYZ out there putting in solar panels and trying to sell power to your customers, uh, that certainly makes it uh, uh, a little less of a concern for us and, and, and something I think we can live with. So, so I think we can address that issue as long as we have ownership of the panels by the participants uh, that have to be, you know, resident customers of, of the village of Yellow Springs. Uh, but there's some other logistic issues that we need to deal with. Um, rates, for example, as Dan said, uh, certainly uh, this is a little, a little different than a behind the meter generator. In the case of a behind the meter generator, uh, you know, in, in essence, the customer is reducing his load on your electric system and you're delivering less power to him. Basically, the village receives its power through one delivery point. Uh, all the power comes in and, and, and then is delivered to you over the, the distribution system. Um, so when a customer puts a, a solar panel on his house, it reduces the load on the electric system. And, and in theory, does reduce a little bit of your cost. So, so they're giving up that part of that revenue that was going for that cost 
uh, we felt it was something that you, know, you could live with. But in this case, where you're going to now have a second source of energy coming into the system and delivering this power to a customer, so you're still delivering the same amount of energy to that customer that you were delivering today without this project, uh, your costs don't change. But yet, uh, if you treat it the way you're net metering now, uh, you would lose that distribution uh, portion of your revenue. So, so we've got to make sure that we retain that as a part of this process so that you don't lose that, that distribution revenue. And again, there's ways to address that uh, in, in the rate models. Uh, in fact, one of the things that uh, the village just did was retain us to do a cost of service study uh, for your electric system uh, that would basically you know, develop those costs, both the power supply and the distribution costs. So, so that's something that would come out of that study so that we would know what those costs are that we need to make sure we recover. So. And what would you estimate the delivery costs were? Right? You said <coughs> earlier you were talking about? Probably between two and three cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, you know, that's, that's roughly where it would be. If you look at your current rate, uh, your residential rate, it's a three-tiered rate, but if you take the middle tier, which is where most of the kilowatt hours are used, uh, that rate is currently six cents a kilowatt hour. It includes 3.7 cents of power cost uh, built into that when the rates were last established. So, so there you'd be looking at 2.3 cents uh, differential. So now if it falls into the, the first tier, the first 500 kilowatt hours, it actually is a penny higher. Uh, that you're recovering because you recover seven cents so but again that's what the cost of service study would address and it would develop what those costs are so that you would know what to establish that rate at so um i guess j just a few other logistical issues in fact these came up at the energy board meeting um obviously there's the question of what happens if somebody moves out of town and so you've got panels that are owned by joe smith joe smith doesn't live here he's no longer a customer what happens to the energy? So that's something that, that certainly needs to get addressed. Um, uh, I think the presentation indicates that individuals will own individual panels and they'll get a pro rata share of the output. And that's easy to say, but what happens if Joe Smith's panels don't work? They need replaced because they got damaged. Um, and so again, that would be something that have to be worked out internally within the co-ownership. But those are details that we'd wanna make sure are, are addressed don't need a customer coming back and saying hey you gave my energy to somebody else because his panels didn't work and he got a credit that he shouldn't have been getting so um, so again those are just some of the other logistical issues I think uh, you know certainly need to get addressed um, I don't know if that kind of answers uh, maybe some of the questions maybe created more questions I'm not sure so. well and I think that one thing that everybody needs to be aware of too is that um, this would if if council decides to proceed this would mean that all of the residential solar for the village once we got the inventory done if this project took up the remaining of the 250 kilowatts that's that's the rest of the residential solar that's available mm -hmm. not saying good or bad is just something you need to be aware of that there wouldn't be any opportunity for anyone else to put residential solar in they would have to be on the list I guess if somebody did leave or however that would work to be on you know part of this or put it in now. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. they, could, they could put it in that before the project starts and then the project has to be reduced by that amount so, so I mean that you know my biggest concern is getting an accurate inventory of what's out there because we're finding them every day literally and knowing that we can very very strictly limit the impact on the village's portfolio because of the long-term commitments that we have in our contract and i mean john and i have talked about that with, with johnny and, and that is a big concern yeah this is our current portfolio and we were given um john did ask amp to look into you know could we more diversify our portfolio even more to be even more environmentally friendly more than our 85 percent that we're currently at and we can but it would cost us substantially more yeah i mean there's there's certainly the opportunity amp by the way is also developing amp is your uh, power supply agency basically american municipal power out of columbus who kind of manages your portfolio for you but you make your own decisions uh, as consoles done here in the past and what projects you want to participate in like the the, uh, the new hydro projects that are coming uh, so you're not, you know, AMP doesn't make those decisions for you. They put opportunities in front of you and you decide if you want to be in the project and if so, how much. 
Uh, AMP is currently looking to develop solar uh, itself uh, you know, for its membership. Uh, and so there's that opportunity possibly as well. Um, but again, uh, you know, in your particular case, you've got, you've got the portfolio pretty full. Uh, I know we were asked a question about maybe divesting of some of that portfolio. Uh, and there is that opportunity if there are other members of, of AMP, other municipal, you know, uh, municipalities that would uh, take over your obligations. So there is some, possibly some opportunity to do that in the future. Not sure exactly, you know, whether that would happen or not. So. But let's say for the sake of argument that we decide that we want to sell some of our shares in one of the hydroelectric projects and we sell those to another municipality, we're still legally obligated should that municipality go defunct and not meet their fiscal responsibilities. That, yeah, that's my understanding of those contracts that you entered into with AMP because they have long term, they've issued debt for those projects right. and they need to make sure that there's somebody on the hook. and. So while you can actually uh, uh, transfer or assign that ownership to another entity, um, ultimately you are still obligated. It doesn't get you out of your obligation. They default. It's that they default, it still falls back on the village. Now, if it fell back, you'd get the power back, obviously, but you'd be paying for something that, and maybe, again, maybe for power you don't need at that time uh, and having to sell it at a loss in the market. Wow, so, could you resell it to some other municipality? You, you could try to do that as well, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what we would need to do to be able to move forward. I mean, this is a very complicated issue, and some of the questions that are being raised are things that have to well, be the, figured out. The first thing that you have to do is, is get an accurate inventory, which is something that Johnny's been working on for the past month since this came before, you know, Energy Board. Brett came in and talked to me, and I had Johnny in the meeting, and then it came to Energy Board. So he's been working on trying to get that. but. As I said, he's finding it every day. He's finding another installation. I mean, so. it is, do you have a sense of um, how long it will take to get an accurate, accurate information? And then, I mean, it also sounds like, well, it, given what's happening, people can continue to be installing. That's that's absolutely correct. People can continue to install. You know, the, the biggest problem is that they're not coming in to inform us that they have it and to get their interconnectivity agreements. Well, we need someone <laughs> who's going to be getting after he's people. He's got, yeah, he's getting his hands pretty full already. <laughs> um, Let's just say that if you have a solar array and you don't have a permit, you should come and get one. <laughs> way. Like, yeah. Um, but, I mean, you know, Johnny. Can, can, can I ask a question? In, in terms of. We're saying Johnny needs to uh, determine how many people have mm -hmm. an array out there. Does he also need to determine, because it's, it sounds like there is an issue as to what are we calculating? Well, yeah, I mean, there, I, I don't, so, there's, so a, there's, just a, finding there's, out a, the there's a disagreement, one. right. So, well, so the building inspector that that is inspecting them when they're being inspected, is saying that we have to say that they could potentially generate the maximum amount that it's rated for. Now, they may not currently have all of those panels on their roof, but they could potentially add panels to the maximum generation for the rest of the equipment that they have in. And that's what the, the inspector is telling us that we need to inventory it as. Dan disagrees with that. So I think, that, I think that's the way that the ordinance is written, the amount of power that's actually not, not what you could do in the future. You could put a, a, a 60 kilowatt inverter on there and have one panel. That doesn't mean that you ever add okay. a second. Well, I mean, I guess, I guess what it comes down to is if this is something that council would like to actively pursue, um, we can begin devoting the staff time to it. Johnny's already let other things go to a back burner so that he could be working on the inventory in preparation for tonight. Is that a good thing? No. But if it's what council wants to happen, then we'll make it happen. Okay. Um, so this might be a stupid question. If people are not coming to the village to let us know that they've got these, are th does that mean they're not getting the net metering? They're, they're just using less electricity, and we just don't know it. Okay. Essentially. Right. And so we're still purchasing power based on what we expect the, our delivery over the grid to be, but people aren't using that power. Right. So we're purchasing, in some cases, more power than what we need. Yes, we could be. We could be. Yeah. 
I and I I would like a I would like a more formal or more formal presentation of exactly what our portfolio is. How old are those sheets? And those they are let those are current. Those are current. Okay, I I guess I don't understand the with Fremont, the with the landfill. I, I'm not sure what what all of the those are different ways that we can further diversify our portfolio those are the yeah. those are what mike mcleory said. yeah what uh again after the last energy board meeting we were asked the question could the village uh, you know basically get rid of its uh participation in what's called the fremont energy center project that's right in reference to fremont it's a natural gas fired plant uh located yeah. up by fremont ohio it's a combined mm -hmm. cycle plant uh but it, but it is natural gas, yeah. uh, so it's not considered obviously a, a renewable resource. Uh, represents about seven or eight percent of your energy on any mm -hmm. given month or year. Um, so we asked that question of AMP, uh, and again, subject to somebody being willing to take over your, you know, your commitment to that, uh, AMP ran some scenarios for us, uh, assuming that you, um, you know, w with and without your Fremont. To show what would happen to your portfolio, mm -hmm. uh, they also have a another landfill gas project, or I should say, additional landfill gas uh, available uh, from a, from an expansion of what's called the Erie <coughs> County landfill. And this is not this is a project that you're not currently in. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's only a few communities in it that are located up by Erie County, and they only marketed to them initially. But uh, that, that's going to be expanded to produce additional energy, uh, you know, more generators installed, uh, and it's uh, roughly 800 kilowatts, and so that's why you see that Erie County on there as well. That, that looked at you taking the 800 kilowatts from Erie County and giving up your uh, participation in the Fremont Energy Center. So that's, that's what's reflected in those portfolios. So. Do you have any sure. sense for, I'm sorry, for how marketable these contracts or commitments are? Well, uh, the... I guess I'll just tell you what I think. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a lot of other clients who, who are in the same situation you're in as far as their municipal electric systems and their number of these different projects. I would expect that there's probably less interest in your hydro pro in the hydro projects, um, uh, but I know, at least I've actually talked to a couple of communities that uh, could be interested in your Fremont Energy Center project. Um, so there could be that possibility of, of divesting yourself of that uh, particular project. Um, the yes. other projects, I'm not sure there's anything else in that portfolio I would want to give up, mm -hmm. uh, to be honest. The wind, um, you know, and the, and the existing landfill gas are very competitively priced as well as they're be being green. Uh, you get some power, f some hydropower from the U New York Power Authority. Um, not a big, it's the little tiny line on the bottom, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but that's the cheapest resource you've got, and it's green as well. It's hydro. So, mm -hmm. so, it's uh, false, right? you know, but the only non renewable resource you have in the portfolio uh, is the Fremont Energy Center or the market power that you buy on occasion so uh, um, one more question and then uh, there's questions from others um, what's our current market exposure How, what are we about well we did a projection for 16 because these hydro projects are not currently online they're, they're right. going to be coming online in 15 and 16 so we looked at 16 when they're all online mm -hmm. uh, you've got about 10 percent in the market uh, based on the projections we've got uh, from AMP. 10% 10, 10 of your energy requirement. Now we're talking yeah. capacity, now we're talking energy. Yeah. Uh, so about 10% of it comes from the market. And I think we want that. We want at least 10% because the thing is, the most, the most green form of energy is, is reduction, and we are doing some reduction in use. Yeah, I'm and glad you brought that up. We, if we reduce, we we don't want to have we don't want to be buying more we need to, uh, that cushion of 10 percent to, uh, to account for any any reductions yeah, that you're, might occur. you're actually a participant in amps uh what they call uh efficiency smart program right uh you've been involved in that pro in that project and, and we are using less and, and you and it will result in you using less we're seeing uh, some very positive uh results from that program and in reducing the amount of energy that uh, you know electric co consumers and even some municipal electric systems who are taking some steps to put LED lighting in that type of thing, uh, and so you're right. You don't want to squeeze that that market number down very low. And again, you could lose you know a large customer. I mean, it's happened before, and you'd hope it wouldn't happen again, uh, but it could happen. And then all of a sudden, you've lost. You know, now you're in a, a situation where you're again selling to the marketplace uh, yeah. in your surplus. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, if you can come up, please. 
Kwaki, uh, Energy Board member. I'd like to just back this up a little. We've been talking a great deal about. Can you talk closer to the mic? Uh, Is the mic on? I don't think it's sure it's on. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Paul, is that on? Okay, it's on. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, there's been a lot of concerns raised about um, the effect that this particular project would have on our portfolio. Um, and I, I just want to remind council and everyone here, this, is, um, this was um, discussed uh, two years ago when we revised the uh, an ordinance originally to allow this net metering to go on and, and, and made some specifications, uh, specifically the 1 and 4 percent for uh, residential and large users. These were numbers that um, we generated uh, with John Courtney, with staff, and within the Energy Board that took into account uh, uh, the village's uh, current and projected energy needs, uh, our portfolio at the time, which is probably hasn't changed much and um, what kind of room we saw in there to make these uh, allowances for local generation. Um, and so based on our, our best knowledge at that time, we went ahead and passed that ordinance. That exists. Um, we are not moving outside of that. What we are asking now is to amend that ordinance, something that we would have done back then had we known that this particular entity existed, had we known about virtual uh, metering pro uh, programs, we would have asked to and haven't included it then. We didn't. It was, you know, it's, it's a churning, constantly changing uh, 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 process, so we weren't aware of it. Um, nonetheless, uh, uh, we're simply. Um, uh, uh, the, um, we, are, we are working within uh, the framework that we've already set up. Um, so we're, we're not, we're not going to do, this doesn't change anything. This doesn't um, threaten our, our, our portfolio or endanger uh, uh, our, our current contracts in any way. It's, it's, um, it's just uh, fleshing out. Um, the uh, process that we've already agreed works here in the village. I just, you know, because I think this is a good discussion to talk more about our energy needs going forward, but that's not what this particular uh, proposal would do. It doesn't alter that in any way. We're, we're working within the caps that we've already um, decided we're, we're work, work for the village. So I wanted to back that up and make sure that that's not a uh, contentious uh, issue for us if we move forward yeah. on this. Okay. Um, I guess I, I would like to suggest that we ask Patty to get together probably with Dan and lay out exactly, I mean we've raised a lot of issues, but lay out, agree upon what the issues are and some kind of timeline to see whether in fact this would then be something that was doable. Well, I think the, I think it should go back to someone asked the question. And I think it was Lori about when Johnny thought he could have the inventory done. I mean, as far as trying to agree on how it should be measured, um, that's one thing. But you still have to get the inventory itself done. And it needs to be consistent, so it needs to be, no matter how you measure it, it needs to be done by village employees. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do we want Johnny and or his crew to take the time right now to get this inventory done? Um, because like, he, as I said, he's already put some time in on it to the expense of other things, but if that's what council wants, that's what we will make happen. I mean. What would I, be a reasonable timeline that would allow the crew to be working on things that they need to work on but still be able to get the I mean <coughs> we're talking about a month yeah, six I mean, months uh, I, I literally I cannot answer that question because we can be doing it and then we have a water main break we have a, a yeah. I, I would not want to give any dates if I, I mean if that's what the council wants us to do we'll Dan and meter man and uh, Brian Church they walk it every month 
and I can just have them start visually looking. I mean, Dan's found five of them, so, uh, you know, we can have him still doing that. And then he calls me as soon as they find them. I, I so mean, my sense wants, is that if if this could be done within one month, two months, maybe three, well, he walks, he, it I would mean, be doable. Get, but otherwise, yeah, the village. He's gonna have to walk. I mean, when does, he, when, does he, when does he when does he walk the the whole village? How how, how many awesome. over how many? He does the whole village every yeah, month. He reads an electric meter every month. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, well, I'd like to hear some. You want to hear from uh, some okay. additional questions before we speak? And I see a number of hands come up. Rick, is this just a follow up? Because otherwise, I'll, I'll make you wait till everybody else is done. Because you've already had your three minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, if you can sit down. Um, I don't know who had your hand up for it. it. Michael Jones. And then. There's a gentleman over here that actually asked. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You can Michael Jones. So, if I am not participating in net metering, but I <clears throat> want to reduce the amount of electricity I buy, mm -hmm. I put a, a, a solar collector up on my roof, and the village give, sells me less electricity. That's also the equivalent of me just turning more lights off in my house and using more electricity. That also reduces the amount of electricity that the village can sell me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I think what you want to get a handle on is how many people have solar arrays or installations out there that are off the books. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens if you say um, in the newspaper, anybody that wants to participate in net metering has to register with the village their utility by the 1st of June. Then Johnny doesn't have to run around and do any of it. Anybody that thinks they want to be part of the program can, but since you're the utility, the, and they, what the, if they don't care, they just want to generate their own power, fine. But if they think they want to redu um, take something out of your pocket, and you're the utility, you can call the shots on that. You can say, well, you know what? If you don't register, you can't participate in net rate metering. And if you try, we'll cut off your power. <laughs> we still have to find them first. They'll, they'll come out. If they think they want to do net metering sometime, they have to come to you. But we already have people who are putting solar arrays on their roof right. and running it directly into their their power system it's not even but, going through but what he's right, saying that, is that that's effectively just a reduction and that right. somebody could reduce by switching to a wood burner rather than an right. electrical it, furnace it, and I that, agree with that but it's still taking the load off the system it, it's taking the load off in a way that's supposed to be regulated that's a bad word but well, what was right. on the PowerPoint here was you have some percentages of load mm -hmm. that you want to stay within mm -hmm. and you want to get a handle on that to know how many solar panels can be participating in net metering total you mm -hmm. see and you don't know how many how, how many unknowns are out there right that's all you have to get a handle on if and if they don't come forward by a day a, a, a drop dead date then you 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 have a fixed number you have an you have a number you can work with so that so that this project knows the scale it can operate on Right. Thank so, you, Michael. I, I understand. Uh, go ahead, sir. Thanks, Jerry. I just want to point out that uh, I'm it's, Jerry Pepin, I'm on energy board. I just want to point out that if you go down to the county to get a building permit, first thing they ask you for is your zoning permit. Mm -hmm. So if the county has not been notified, they need to be notified that if anybody wants to do a solar installation in Yellow Springs, they have to have a solar permit before they'll issue them a building permit. We've already discussed that with them, and um, yeah, it, apparently they're not enforcing that <laughs> down there. 
I mean, Johnny's had conversations with them already about that. Because yes, that is, you're correct, that is the way it's supposed to work. But it's not the way it's working. Okay. So. All right. Harvey. First, I'd like to uh, reiterate uh, Dan's first point. Energy, my name is Harvey Page. Uh, global climate change. This is Meadow Lake. This is on May 21st, 2014. The older part of my house, which was built in 1955, had a foot of water in it for the first Oops. time. No, sorry about that. Not be <laughs> uh, had water in the basement. Why? Because there are two storm sewers here. Neither of them were able to drain that water. There's a person standing in the middle of Meadow Lane in maybe what, a foot of water? You can take that. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing, I'm going to speak in favor of this idea. When I wanted to put up solar, I talked to the village manager at the time. I said, where can I put it? How can I do this? I talked to some organizations in the village, and they wanted extra engineering studies and things like that, which made it impossible. So I paid about 50 or 60% premium to put mine in the backyard, rather than ask the neighbors to cut down their trees. So I'm very much in favor of it. Right now, I, uh, since um, uh, April of 2011, I've generated uh, 14,261 kilowatt hours. And I've used from the utility uh, 376 kilowatt hours. And I have paid for um, uh, about 48, 48,000, no, uh, 4,800 kilowatt hours. I buy uh, uh, 100 per month with a minimum charge. Um, so, you know, this village is interested in being green. And by being a little more green, we're not <coughs> robbing anyone. We're contributing to the greening of the area. That power will always be used. The, re, the green power, the, uh, the uh, power from amp, will always be used. If we have to sell some of it back, so what? There are a lot of things that we do that cost us a little bit more than doing things in the usual way. The village should not be a money-making organization. The village should satisfy <coughs> the wants and desires of the village. Thank you. You and then you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, sorry. <laughs> I'm soft spoken. I'm Barb Cullen Stratton. I'm not an energy board member, but I am a very committed resident of Yellow Springs, have been for 25 years, committed to this project and going green. One thing I'll say about going green I admire the, the uh, council's comments about already having a green portfolio that's 85% green or some such figure. What I'll say to that is local green is better than green elsewhere. We need to put <coughs> green here in this community because that stimulates further thinking in a, in a positive direction of change. And you have people who are very committed here and who are willing to look at different models, work very cooperatively with council to make that happen. So I would say that. The other point I'd like to make is, I don't know, but I would think that an LLC as a business might actually generate some tax revenue to the, to the village as well. Thank you. Yes, come on. <laughs> My name is Stuart Headley. I live in the village. I live in a green generation house. It's very efficient, 100% electric. Um, just bought an EV. It's my only vehicle, so I, I run 100% electricity. My big issue is global warming. It's very important to me. I've got a 15-year-old son. He's like, what are you all doing about this? So I made a commitment to do something about it. The only way to get there to, to reduce your carbon footprint in, in a real and meaningful way is to, to use 100% renewable energy. Um, for Yellow Springs to get there, by the way, I really I agree, getting to 80, 85%, whatever the actual number is, that's amazing, we should, we should celebrate that. Not a lot of communities are actually doing that, so thank you. Um, I think it's important that we get to 100%, and I think the only real way for us to viably to get to 100% is to look at all of our local renewable options and a community solar project is one of them that makes sense for me. I've got a house, 
hundred year old trees around it, can't cut them down, doesn't make sense. Would love to participate in a community solar array. Great. All right. Um, I'm going to take these last two comments and then a close discussion. So go ahead. And then you in the back. Yes, you. Uh, Richard Lapides. I'm having a hard time sorting out the strategic issues and the tactical issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also, uh, of course, I mean, it's not a question of whether we will be 100% renewable. It's a question of when and how. I mean, that's obviously coming our way, and it's creating all these mm, tactical bumps that have to be sorted out carefully in order to preserve something else, which is this. When reaching for one of the other goals we have in the village is for the village to be an affordable place for many kinds of people to live. That means that we have to be very mindful of our tax burden. And part of our tax burdens are presently offset by some of the, I'll call them businesses, the village has been in for many generations, such as transmission power transmission. So it turns out that the tactical, being ta blundering tactically can create certain undesirable strategic effects. However, I believe that uh, behind the meter the power sourcing is going to be pretty much ubiquitous in the next uh, and therefore, it will be necessary to change many routines of uh, the operations of the village. And the only thing we want to be careful of is not to change them in a way that makes us more affor less affordable. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Yes, come on up. My name is Pat Brown, and I've had solar many years here in Yellow Springs. I'm very appreciative, and I really would plug that we do this. Um, like people have said, climate change is upon us. If we do not address this, all the other crap that's around us means nothing. We need to do this. We also need to look at our portfolio, and if there is a way to sell that 7% gas, put at least 2% more into solar into this community because there will be future needs for it. Don't stick it all into something else. Keep it local. And I really, really, really encourage you to do this. Okay. I'll get one more. I lied. I'll take one more. <laughs> I'm Bob Brecka, village resident as well, and I support this project and think that it's important to do. And one of the things I'd, I've been saying for a few years that I would like to see happen is more planning. And I know, John, Courtney, you've said we, we do more planning than most places seem to do. But, but I think the only way to make sense of this solar issue right now and compared to the rest of our portfolio is to understand the data on an hourly basis throughout the year because we're mixing up the capacity we have and the energy we're generating and which percentage of each one we're using. And solar energy in the summer is valuable energy. It's more expensive energy than average baseload energy because we're generating it at times of the day and times of the year when electricity is more expensive. So we're actually reducing the need for external, more expensive energy from the grid. There, there's a whole bunch of other things we can say about this, but it also goes into what Richard Lapides was talking about. What are we going to be looking at in the future? We talk, we, I agree, efficiency, Lori is right. That's the most important thing we can, be, we can be doing. But at the same time, we're becoming more efficient. We have, we're buying an electric car. RV has an electric car. I have an electric car. We're going to have people who are, I'm doubling my electric load because of my electric car. I've saved and saved and saved to where I spent, where I have 250 kilowatt hours a month electric bill. But now I'm doubling it because I'm switching from gasoline to electric for my car. <laughs> There's a lot of these things that we haven't, I would claim, we have not thought through in a careful way, in a real way of looking at different scenarios for the future of how electricity use may change. To go 100% 
carbon free. If we really want to do that, it means using a lot more electricity in the future. It means using a lot more heat pumps, electric heat pumps, electric vehicles. And so we'll need more electricity in the future. I'm not saying that's exactly what's going to happen, but it's the only way to go carbon free is to use more electricity. And so I think there's a big set of complicated things that we need to look at here. And I, don't, I can't imagine this little bit of electricity being the piece that's going to sort of bump us up against buying too much electricity in the future. Great. Thank you, Bob. All right. Um, so I'm going to close discussion for now. This is not the end of this because it's more complicated than this discussion can handle. Um, so it will be coming back to council. Um, uh, I, uh, I think uh, Marianne had a suggestion that staff try to get the inventory completed. Um, obviously, we don't want you to you know, not fix a water main because you're out looking for solar panels. But um, if, if it can be done in a reasonable fashion and you can get to a point where you feel reasonably secure that this is where we are right now, that would be a good thing to do in, say, two months, three months-ish. And if it needs more than that, we can do it. We have an old solar panel on our roof, so I might need to talk to you. <laughs> it is unusable. <laughs> from the 70s. From the 70s. It's unusable. <laughs> so. I, I guess I'd like to, to try to pinpoint it more in, in 90 days. Mm -hmm. 90 days. 90 days in... And someone look at the calendar and say that you'll be coming back to us in a time frame so everybody knows that, you know, what we're working on. At the same time, could we work on the other questions? Early too? April. I'm could sorry. At the same time, could we work on the other questions to work on the question of what exactly constitutes, you know, what, what, how what it's going to be measured? And, and well, yeah, well, I'm assuming that they would be doing that also and within and that time frame. So we. And also look at, you know, what type of, of rate program that we could come up with that, that's reasonable. Well, John Courtney is working on a rate study for, for us. So. And so that also, I think, okay. will be helpful for us to have. And um, when he does that, I would like a, just a, I think, a public presentation of this handout that for just went board. around so that people, not just us, but people in the community have a really clear idea of what our portfolio looks like right now um, so that we can make the best decision. Yeah. Um, anything yeah. else? I just want to, so uh, Dan or whoever, besides the energy board, is there another task force working on this? Well, I think uh, you're, you guys are, are sort of oriented that direction in the operation. So there's a, there's a, a carbon action group in town. Uh -huh. and. Electricity or that component is part of a, of a bigger carbon uh, action plan, and so the need to understand it, as lawyers said, that's important. But we're not actually working on any specific proposals or anything along that lines. This we're is just looking to understand what's happening. Right. That's well, a recommendation I would make, um, because another complicated issue that's come to us is the you know municipal broadband issue, and. I think for us to keep this moving forward, if we can have consistent reports similar to a community access panel uh, every month is reporting out on, you know, sort of step by step, uh, I would like to see that happen in tandem. Um, I mean, I have a lot of other questions, but that's just one recommendation. So if we were to use the 90 day or whatever, like if we'd said the 3rd of April, which is a Friday, that's approximately. Well, it'd be the, whatever the first council meeting is. First council meeting in April, <laughs> the, the 6th. 6th. Yeah, well, it would have to be ready Recorded. by that yeah. council meeting. Mm -hmm. And that the other work that would need to be being <coughs> done could be being done, the other information studies, whatever could be being done during that 90-day period with reports made on a monthly basis. I mean, for example, what is the Yellow Springs Community Solar LLC going to look like? I mean, that would be, you know, one thing that, you know, it'd be nice to just kind of 
have I, that. I, I, I can answer that right up front. But I, but I guess. Yeah, I, I want to, we need to move to an, our right. other discussions because we still have sure. several items. But if we agenda. get reports like that, you know, we can digest those. The, the one thing, do it, do it online or uh, The community access panel is part of their minutes every month. They're reporting that to council. So. Now you have a question back here. Okay, quickly. As you're looking at this thing holistically, um, is there a deadline for these contracts coming up that would force you into having to make a decision too soon? These other contracts, the energy that you're purchasing, just to keep that in mind, because mm -hmm. if you're looking about this long term, what's going to be like five years, ten years to plan, that's something to know because right. maybe we'll relook at how we just do everything. You know? Johnny so and I have already actually begun discussions of the the first contract I think we have that expires is in seven years. And All right, so, it, yeah. so that's not going to right. I won't impinge okay. on this Thank really. You. Thanks. All right. Okay, so um, we will come back to that issue. I know that that was the issue many of you are here for. Just a reminder, we have to leave our door open as a open meetings thing. So if you want to uh, leave, that's great. It's fine. You can, although we have many scintillating topics awaiting you. Uh. Um, uh, however, if you do leave, uh, please don't talk in the hallway. Wait till you get downstairs and you can shout to the heavens if you want. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Johnny, whatever you want. Yeah, thanks, everyone. It's great. Okay. She's going to use the pointer on her presentation oh, okay. about the grant. Great. Okay. Are you guys ready? Ready to? Yeah. Begin the next presentation. Yeah. Okay, so the next topic is the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant proposal, and this is coming from the Environmental Commission. Or yes, is, yes, from the Environmental Commission. Um, I think actually it was Patty who found out about the grant originally, and um, so this is a, a grant that the Environmental Commission is proposing to apply for and requesting council approval to do that. It's a, the idea of this grant would be to enhance part of our, um, our watershed. And in this case, we're, oh. this get ready? Okay, so there, there are underground sources of water in the western edge of the building that funnel under Dayton Street and come out into a channel. And that channel becomes a stream, and on the glass farm, there's a detention area. And then the, the purpose of the detention area is flood control so that the stream doesn't flood these properties as it moves here. And that stream comes around here, and then uh, that it gets together with Ellis Pond. It gets to the Ellis Pond over yep. here. And then it comes around. And that field is right there. Field. The village building, which is, comes around, it goes uh, into the wine, yeah, it's into the wine pond, and eventually into the Yellow Springs Creek in the Glen. And what we're, the, the purpose of the grants are to help urban areas um, revitalize their waterways and also educate communities about uh, their waterways and uh, enable the community to have more access to the waterway. Well, we have a unique situation in the uh, glass farm here with the detention area because beavers have created a dam, uh, they have uh, created a lot of, of biological diversity, lots of new animals, fish, insects, and then the village inserted a flow device, which is so far functioning and regulating the water level in the dam. So the grant that we'd be applying for would be 
uh, multi-purpose in that area of the glass farm, which would be um, increasing the natural plants in the area, in that stream area, working to have a beaver management plan so that beavers are not adversely impacting either the, uh, the flow device, flow, or <coughs> private property, in other words, not chewing up <laughs> neighbors' trees, um, planting plants that the beavers like, and also removing some of the invasive species that have been, especially the Bradford pear, that has been developed in the uh, glass farm. Um, along with this, we would have partners. This is part of the grant is you have to have five partners, and we've had initial conversations with Antioch College, with Tecumseh Land Trust, with YSI, and with Five Rivers Metro Park and Green Environmental Coalition. Um, and I didn't introduce the Environmental Commission either. I'd like, I'd like we, we do stand and I'll introduce uh, Jessica Ambrosio, uh, who works at Antioch as a hydrologist. Um, Nadia Malarkey, who is Nadia, a landscaping I, business. I have a garden designer. Yeah, garden designer. Uh, Tom Dietrich, um, who's an environmental engineer. engineer. And Dewar Headley, who is a you an environmental engineer as yeah. well, yeah. So, so um, we have been uh, working on uh, this proposal that's in front of council. Does anyone else, Tom? Do you want to say anything? Tom wants to Yeah, I think it's I think it's a great opportunity. Um, you know, to get uh, all the partners on board. It's, it's not a huge amount of money that the village would be committing, but leveraging the partners. We'd be getting uh, you know, uh, good return on the investment, um, and I think it's it's such a great resource. It's it just amazes me the biodiversity how it keeps increasing. And just the other day, um, there was this uh, flock of of uh, <laughs> sandhill cranes landed at the glass farm. I mean, just more and more biodiversity, it's becoming more and more of a resource. And so I think it's something that um, by investing a little bit in the, in the plants and wildlife and the plants and the management of the, of the area, um, and then leveraging that with education, it's, it's just a really natural fit and something that the community can really benefit. And so we would see that um, Antioch students, um, public school students, uh, adult volunteers could be helping with this program with the, the partners. And um, it's a one-to-one -one match. So for example, if we applied for 25000 our match could be in in-kind services, um, resources, uh, supplies, as well as some monetary amount which we could possibly seek grant from the community foundation use some of the green space fund money um, so patty would you like to say anything you know i it, i think this is a good project if if this is in fact the way the council wants to proceed with this piece of property um, i think it's a good opportunity i just think in my conversations with marianne you know Council needs to decide if this is the way you want to go. If, you, if this is the way we want to use this piece of property, then I think this is a good opportunity to develop it more in that way because I think that Tom is right in that every day you're seeing more diversity out there. Tom, uh, John and I were actually out there today um, looking around a little bit and I was showing him the, the beaver device. It's just, it is currently in a conservation easement um, or zoning. zoning. Well, zone, yes, but there's an actual <coughs> ordinance somewhere that shows. Um, yeah. um, Judy found this actually today um, that it is establishing a conservation area and future easement on that property. So um, this is from 2005. So if in fact, you know, I think part of the vision is to have walkways and trails out there for educational purposes and 
as I told Marianne, I worked on a lot of projects like this when I was an undergrad. Um, you can get plenty of volunteers to, to do this kind of thing. So if this is how council would like to proceed with this pr property, this is an excellent opportunity to get the funding to do it. It is a very short time frame. It is. Yeah. Um, so we don't really even have a time to even have a discussion yes, about yes. whether how we want to think about that the dead property. Yeah, the deadline is in February. Is it February 15th? Third. February, February 3rd. 3rd. Wow. But this is a yearly grant? This is a grant that comes up every year? I don't know. I believe it is, yeah. Jessica, you, it, yeah, Jessica looked into that part. It, it, um, to me, it feels like, um, I think it's very interesting, and um, it just feels a little fast for um, it, to try to, we would effectively have to make the decision tonight without really being able to really think about the glass farm. Um, and, and so I'm, I think I'm feeling a little hesitant um, because of the, uh, it's such a rapid deadline. Because the other thing I'm uh, concerned about is our staff is, got some very big projects on their lap right now the streets and parks people um, and so I, I it just I, it feels like a lot to me um, it, w with a, a deadline of February 3rd yeah I, I, I guess my concern I have a couple um, in in one you know we're, we we talk about the creek that runs into the uh, retention area but we also have a a village built if for lack of a better word a, a drainage ditch that was supposed to run to the retention pond and it can't get there because we can't get in there to, to clean it because we have to get on private property to do it and I don't think at the time that they put it in they thought that would be an issue and then, then number two uh, I understand now that that area is is a uh, conservation area but we do have a retention pond there mm -hmm. and you know if I'm correct they're pretty strict about what you can you cannot do in conservation areas and 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 I have to look at the other part of the glass farm area. Uh, if there were thoughts of developing it, you know, what is our access now to that retention pond that we already have there? And, and when we, whether good or bad, when we decided to uh, put the beaver device there. I don't think a lot of us realize that when you do that, and I only found that out after the fact, once you do that, what beavers do is create a wet area and, and wetlands. Yeah. And you know, I, it just so happened that they had a nice two hour PBS presentation <laughs> on mm -hmm the introduction of beavers back into areas and what is what is the result? Mm -hmm. now we have a, a small area now but uh, beavers do expand and 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 they have a good uh, ability to create more wetland no that no, the, the wetland I'm sorry okay I'm sorry, okay. Finish, I'm sorry. You know, but you know, and, and I'm just going by the research that I did and, and, and what I saw and so forth. So you know, I, I think you know, council has to also determine what we're going to do with the glass farm as a whole, and then <coughs> look at some alternatives and some other issues that will come up. I, I'm kind of like uh, Lori, uh, you know. I don't even have time to think about it, you know, because given the short timetable that you have to put that grant in, um, I'm inclined to say, let's take more time and 
if we, we miss this cycle, we'll, we'll have to look at the, the, the next cycle. But uh, I, I, I myself would, would not support moving forward with uh, this grant right now. So. What were you going to say, guys? Well, uh, council agreed to have this area zoned conservation. Council did that, and um, in terms of the rest of the glass farm, having this area as conservation means that that then can be the set aside for it. However, it gets developed, housing, mixed unit, mixed development, whatever. This is the set aside then for that area, and the 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 wetland is not going to increase in, in size. It's being governed by the flow device and the the dam that the beavers have made. So the, the dimension of the wetland, I mean, it, it'll raise and lower a little depending on rain flow and uh, lack of rain flow, but it's not going to keep getting bigger. And it's also determined by the bowl, the shape of the, the property. I mean, this is an amazing area we have. So, I mean, I'm one person and I want to go for it, but it is truly an amazing area and um, not too many communities are able to have a wetland natural area right within their community. I mean, you know, it took something that was a drainage ditch and made it into something that's beautiful and that could really be used by the community. A and in regard to, uh, Jerry, that ditch that runs uh, along the church and uh, Thistle Creek, um, part of this would be to work with the private the property owners along that area so that their concerns are addressed. And we can actually be working with Thistle Creek in terms of um, getting into the area there, regardless of the grant. But. So I, I, I guess I have two questions. One is, um, I know you've had initial conversations with the potential partners. But I guess I'd like to get more of a feeling for what they would do. Uh, well, no, not what the, they would do. I think that's clear. But what what are they saying, and what are their commitments? And well, why don't let's ask Jessica. Jessica, could you say something about what Antioch might <coughs> do? Um, Antioch College. Uh, I work in the cooperative education program, even though I do have a background in engineering and hydrology. And I guess um, from our part, we would incorporate some of these projects into some of our courses. Um, so we could have students, for example, in our botany class do a plant ID survey for the project that would identify all of the native and invasive species currently on site. Uh, we have a conservation biology class and aquatic biology class that could also do some initial inventories at no cost um, to the project or offered in kind. Um, and we would also be um, very interested in any educational opportunities. So as far as developing the walking paths, the signage, um, incorporating cooperative education students into the project so that's where so is Antioch College definitely in <coughs> yes okay and uh, how about other partners that you've talked to any other that are I mean well um, Krista with the Tecumseh Land Trust was very interested in being involved mm -hmm. she's interested but she just said to me I've got all these questions I don't know about and well yeah we uh, we uh, haven't uh, I mean that's what made me uh, one of the things that made me nervous is that one of these key partners was writing me asking me for uh -huh. answers and I didn't have anything more than what was in the packet and so mm -hmm. that gave me a little bit of anxiety yeah I, I got an email from Krista at like 6 15 or something mm -hmm. this evening right. so and, and who who is it's there were a couple other part there because YSI, oh, YSI um, I had talked to uh, uh, Chris Palacios about doing water testing using their water testing equipment um, uh, Tom you talked to Five Rivers yeah so Five Rivers Venture Parks um, I used to work there and still have good contacts there one of their land stewardship managers came out and did a walk around with me mm -hmm. and said this is an amazing place already and it's a great opportunity um, she was very supportive, um, had lots of advice, put me in contact with Green County Parks, had a meeting with the Green County Park Director later this month. Um, 
she initially just via email was interested in learning more about the project. Um, but Five Rivers specifically, um, my contact, the land stewardship manager would provide guidance and, and uh, support through uh, like consulting. And they also have educational resources that we could provide um, that they would be willing to share that we could put in the hands of the schools um, to you know provide educational opportunities to get students out there. Because it's hard for teachers to come up with those materials, so if we can just provide those, that would be a huge asset. Um, and then there's also educational signage or interpretive signage. They already have templates for that we could possibly just print new signs and just install them or at least get um, draft um, graphic designs and modify those. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the resources that they're going to offer. What, what would, would the village's obligation be after the, the one year or two years of the grant? Uh, you know, because, because I also have to, I have to, to look at, you know, given that I got a limited staff to begin with, uh, adding some additional tasks um, to them, uh, I, I can't see, I, I can't, I have a hard time doing that. Well, I, and you know, honestly, I don't think that came up in the discussions at the, at the meeting. I mean, it's a good question because it was part of the discussion when we talked about the TLT. The, right. yeah, the, the, the grant, it's, the it's, NRAC it's, grant. It's, for, the, it's the after right. part of it's it. The, you know, it's the you, continued maintenance. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. That's a huge concern mm -hmm. for me, too, because I, I understand that village has limited resources. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to ask, you know, them to get away from fixing the water main break or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, currently, the village is doing nothing to maintain the site except for, you know, dealing with the flow, making sure that it functions as a retention basin. So that is already an existing obligation that we um, Well, and we were actively involved in keeping the beavers there, right? <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, flow, the flow device was installed so that the beavers could stay right. without us having to rip their dam out every other day. And, and still retain the function. It's, the right, correct. Basin. Right. So, so, so and, and then the, that, is, yeah. that remains. But <laughs> Beyond that, um, there really, if nothing, if, if there was the new vegetation, you know, some vegetation restoration occurred, um, the site essentially becomes self-sustaining. Um, there could be some mowing or burning of the site potentially to manage the vegetation, but essentially you're doing nothing with it now. That could go on. Yeah, because it was it was considered a retention pond. Well, no, because not just the retention yeah, but, area. There's yeah. a lot of acres outside of the water right. that, that have vegetation. Yeah, but, right, but, but I, I noticed in your proposal you were talking about mowing and so forth. And right, the mowing of the paths. So there's some walking trails that currently volunteers. You say there are, there are walking trails that are, are in now? Yeah. Currently, yes. Okay, but Village did not put those walking trails in. Right. So people just by walking yeah. created created a trail, yes. which then, wow. you know, again you, 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 we're, we're, well, you know, vo volunteers are good, but still, you know, I, I have to look back at when when that mouse walks away, people are going to look at the village to keep this thing up, and that's the, that's my only only issue. There. One other thing I really like about the proposal is. Um, the thinking about how to uh, consider all the stakeholders, you know, the property owners, the community, education. Um, and I, I guess I'd like to understand a little bit more about, I guess in particular, you know, we don't have any of the property owners here um, or of the, you know, surrounding. So I yeah, don't know. We do yeah. actually have two people at least. Three, four, okay. people who, that, whose that property is, abut okay. that the have, stream and one. Okay, that have spoken about it? Okay. No, they haven't spoken about it. Well, Tom, I, Deward, uh, Barbara, and uh, Scott and Bettina. I haven't said anything, but I, I fully support the project, and I'm um, interested in possible uh, 
restoration of the street. <coughs> And I need to ask this other question. Are Bieber's doing damage to to private property out there? Is there a concern there? Um, Bieber's have cut down some trees on Rick Donahoe's property. And so, I mean, one of the things that this is proposing would be to get fencing so that when there are trees that are need to be protected, they can be protected. Fencing, as in, put around each individual tree. Either around, either around each tree or along the, the an actual thing. border fence. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I guess I I see both sides, and if it's possible to have more information and details, and and if this is forming more at our next meeting. Um, I'd be open to considering that. I don't, I don't know where other council members are. Um, but I, I do agree that there are a lot of things to think about. And, and one of them, to me, is the, just how we're looking at all that property. Um, yeah, I, I mean, personally, I think I'd be more comfortable just waiting till next year if, if Krista is saying, Krista's got all kinds of things that she's raising um, <coughs> and that just I get like I said that's partly what made me no, feel I anxious seen, about this um, I mean, I she says I, I found the recommendation but I have lots of questions I'm wondering if you want to add a conservation e easement um, Doug Bailey of the community garden group or whatever they're called um, is sure to have ideas um, be good to talk to him if you haven't so it's just that, that I think getting that email right before the meeting makes me um, just feel like okay um, well um, and then thinking about uh, for me the big consideration is this uh, it's exactly what's expected of staff uh, afterwards but more during like what it what would be expected of staff how much time is what what's what what are what is the village contribution on this um, I would like to have a, a clearer feel for that what what if we came back to the next council meeting with answers to most of the questions that have been asked I mean we have the plan more fleshed out as well as partners and what partners would do as well as what village staff would or wouldn't be obligated to do and what kind of uh, management plan um, and uh, group would need to be in place to carry it forward and a more complete representation of the concerns of property owners, I would I would like to hear. I, I, I guess I'd have to agree with Lori. I, I think we should put it off for a year and do the proper research and so forth, come back with the plan, the four partners sign on saying that they work the, what they want to do, and then we, we move forward. And that would also give council a, an opportunity to at least to discuss that whole area, which we we have not done. And, uh, granted that this is a a small part that has been set aside for for conservation, but I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not willing to 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 sign on myself as as, as you know, council. I'd like to. So, do you feel uh, anxious about the effect on staff, Patty? I, I think that staff can participate in kind and, and do some of the work. I mean, Marianne and I talked a little bit about, you know, what could be done by volunteers from the other stakeholders or community volunteers and what staff could contribute. I think I would be more concerned about the maintenance issue because we didn't discuss that. And part of the plan is the removal of the invasive species and, and you have to keep on those to keep them out. Uh, which is was the concern that we raised about the NRAC grant um, but that said I think that the staff could support our part of this I mean I would be willing to say that we could help with you know depending on how many trails we're talking about you know if they can be mowed we could potentially continue you know things like that or contribute to that but um, 
also part of it would have to be done by the other the other stakeholders. I mean, we could not contribute, you know, 100% of it, but we what could I, contribute some, yes. And do you have time in the next, uh, before the next meeting to to work through these, these issues? Well, yeah, I think, um, I think Mary Ann and Tom have done a lot of it and, and Jessica looking at, you know, the different stakeholders and what they can contribute. If we can come up with a more definite idea of what they can contribute before the next meeting, I think that that could be, we could figure that out and bring that to council. All right, well, if you're, if you're okay with it um, and you, if you think you can get I'm, I'm, I'm only to hear it at the next meeting. Um, I just, it feels, a, I wish it were in a little bit further, further form than it is right now, and that's where my anxiety is coming from. Next meeting is the 20th. It's actually the 20th yeah. because the 19th is. Morning. John, have you been out to this property? Have you? Uh, there this afternoon. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, so I guess I'm, uh, it sounds like it's three. Or at least three of us are in favor with of you coming back to us next time with additional information with additional information I'm not guaranteeing and, and, and not that guaranteeing. does that does still give you time to get it in so okay do you I just think maybe, just some work to I be I think done. there might be a one or two more people that okay <coughs> Nadia thanks do I have to introduce myself again not okay. sorry well um a couple of things I, I'd like you to consider um, and, and think, I do understand the issue of the time and one thing we did talk a lot about was the issue of maintenance because that's, I, I deal with that a lot, that's my work um, and I know that after a project starts, you know, who's going to take care of it. So that is something definitely that we're going to be addressing um, even using some of the funds to maybe hire, a, you know, resources to do that. So it's not just based on the dreamy world of volunteers, which doesn't always pan out. But one thing about the property, when you're talking about biodiversity, I did walk around with it with Tom the other day, and those calorie pears are an infestation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking potential forest. And I, I was, hor I mean, I've seen the property just driving by, but walking through it, it is pretty dense vegetation. So the longer that waits, mm -hmm the more of a monoculture we're going to be creating this one property, which is going to take a lot of time. So um, getting rid of that is, is really good. And the other benefit, if you're looking at the, the village and climate change, is that we're planning to create diverse native species in the upper, upper lands with native grasses. And prairie grasses have six, up to six to eight foot roots. And um, in terms of mitigation of CO2 emissions, prairies create a huge amount of <coughs> absorption of carbon emissions. So it's something to look at holistically as we move forward as a green village. What impact is this particular place going to have on biodiversity, you know, increasing carbon mitigation where it can be absorbed and also creating a space for people to be in touch with nature where they're not always sitting in front of their computers but can go out, see it, touch it, feel it and see what's, what's coming to our village. Um, and we are very concerned about the long-term management. It's not just like, whoopee, we've got this money, we're putting it up, but how is this really going to be sustainable? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Yeah, Richard? Richard Lapiz, just as an uninformed citizen, what, what is the acreage of the area you have been discussing, approximately? The, the acres, five it, acres. Uh, that that portion of the glass farm is approximately 14 acres that whole portion <coughs> but the part that we're talking about is what well, we figured about half of that so, so, so there's part of that portion that's being farmed traditionally being rented out and then there's an area um, that that's on the western part the northern part there's an area of community gardens so we're really talking about the stream wetland area and then to the south of that. The total amount of acreage is about seven roughly. about seven acres probably. No, the total of the glass farm. Oh, 40 45. Oh. So we have 45 acres of which at most 14 and at present seven are being considered for uh, ecological development. Yeah. Is that a rough synopsis? 
Yeah. Okay, and so what um, Jerry was asking was, what about the rest of the story? What about the remainder of the acreage? Is there a master plan for the remainder of the acreage? No. Nothing. Okay. That's so it's on the table. It's been hived off for development because it lends itself uh, circumstantially. It's just good fortune. And the rest of the story is we don't know what. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just wanted to be under because glass farm's been around a long time. One hears about it quite often, and I guess I always thought there must have been something about glass farm that we understood strategically, but I guess that's not true. Well, so we sort of have this lucky environmental mm, incident um, waving a big flag that says, "What about the whole glass farm?" I mean, why do we have it? The actually, it, it's actually small. The, the small amount for the farmland, and it's actually partially addressed in this conservation easement, um, in in a way because it so says that they essentially they couldn't really decide what they wanted to do with it. Yeah, it's it's been a, a subject of controversy. I think affordable housing. Uh, affordable housing yeah. was a big okay. issue. Yeah. Well, all right. Thank you very much. All right, um, so I think we're, um, we're okay to move forward, bring it back to us next time, and, uh, and, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about it more next time. Um, so finally, we have a selection of dates for a joint meeting of Miami Township Trustees. Do we have? Oh, I want to put that off the okay. yeah. yeah, why don't we go ahead and, no, I know that, but I, I'm going through the ch type things. But yeah. um, the, the next thing, then, so we'll we'll do the joint meeting at our next meeting. Put that on the next agenda. The Antioch EEF grant request was laid upon our table, and then we have two some nominations for committees, and then we will effectively be at the end of the bulk of our meeting. Go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Barbara Sanborn. And I'm representing a group from Antioch College, uh, and we're asking for a letter of support for a proposal to receive an Ohio Institute of Environmental Education grant. I believe that you have a copy of our letter of intent for you, and also a letter that I wrote to you, to council members. Asking for that, should I should I read that? Or no, we, we. I think we can read it. So basically, this is just a letter of support. It doesn't commit the the village no, to. It, although um, there's some uh, common ground, I think, mm -hmm. for efforts on the part of the village, uh, the plans to install. Uh, to electric vehicle charging stations. That's correct. Fits very nicely with this project, which also involves uh, electric vehicle charging station and an educational kiosk that accompanies that, and it's uh, a photovoltaic charging uh, or powering of the electric vehicle uh, charging. So uh, I think there's some compatibility of the of the efforts that um, maybe each can be viewed as an asset of the other. And I, I did sketch out a, a, an example letter of support that would include that mention of the, of the village's plan. I'm not sure how old the village is today. Can, 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 can I ask you a question here? Sure. Uh, you, you provided a letter of intent, and I, I, is this the and, and I guess the way I was reading it is that this was the uh, application? So the application has two parts. The initial stage is to submit a letter of intent to okay. apply. Okay. So then once that letter of, it, of intent is approved, then one proceeds to the next step, which is the full application. Okay, so, so number one, you haven't been approved for anything yet. Oh, oh yeah, well, the letter of intent was approved. Okay, the letter of intent was approved. Okay, within that letter of intent, you said you, you had an uh, anticipated list of collaborators. Okay, and 
you listed the you, well you listed council as one along with others Our village of Yellowstone. okay yes. now were these folks contacted prior to sending in this or be, be, and, and the reason I, I, I asked the question is uh, as a collaborator collaborator I'm 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 a little bit more than just sending in a a letter of support that that says that I kind of agreed to do some things. A am I re am I reading reading that correctly in in, in in the interpretation of what they were were, were asking for in that letter of intent? Yeah, I think that the more collaborators you have, the better, and the more they're willing to offer, the better. But even a signal of support is good, or that this is a welcome uh, addition to the community. No, no but, I, but I guess is your, when is your deadline for this? It's, uh, it's, a, it's January fifteenth. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, obviously, it would have been nice to get this a little sooner um, because it's hard. It gets, when it gets this time of night, I start getting really tired and it feels really hard to make any kind of decision at this time of night. Um, and I mean, I, I, I can't tell exactly what you're asking. Are you no. just asking for a letter? Yes. Yeah. Was, that's the end of our commitment. We just send this letter in and it's not gonna require more staff time of us. More, more staff time, <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and, also, I think it would be important for you, for the people contributing to the letter to clarify, you know, exactly what are the plans uh, for installation of the charging. And station. what if we? What if the letter was more about our uh, that we appreciated the solar field, you know, being built on Antioch College? If we didn't like <coughs> highlight the charging stations? Oh well, this this is. Uh, this proposal is to build the charging station no, and the educational that. kiosk. So that's what we want support for. Is for but, I mean, do we have to mention our intent or not to build those charging stations in the village in our letter? That's that's up to you. I, that was you know something you, that you I have had a concern about. about that? I mean, we just haven't talked about it for uh, mm -hmm. since I've been on council. Are you right? That was well, I. Johnny and I, Johnny and I talked about it because he found two charging stations. Oh, okay. At, we, I mean, we already have them, uh -huh. and the intent is to put one here at our building and then put one down by the hotel when the oh. hotel is there. So we do have them, okay. and we do intend to put them in. Right. So I mean, that part of it is. is and, not and to me, that is one could say that is being collaborative. You know, we're putting them in; they're putting them in. I mean. I, I, all, all this is asking is for us to all support I'm what they're doing, and we're also saying we're 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 into this thing. We're going to do it ourselves. Could I, um, I? I will say that it it's a normal it's a normal thing for entities to write letters yeah. of support for I each other that. in these grants, and so I mean if you know. Yeah, no, I, I don't really have a problem. It's just I, I never like getting things on my desk at the last minute that I have to think about it almost 10 o'clock at night <laughs> when I've been in meetings all day long. And so this is about the 49th millionth decision <laughs> I've had to think about. So having it thrown at my desk is what makes me feel. And they've all been pretty in-depth issues, too. Yeah. I just, I mean, did, did, I, did I, we know about this? About the, okay. So that's all, I have no concern about it at all. No. I want to make that clear. I think it's wonderful. But I just want to make sure that, you know, in writing this, that that is our intent, which I think is what you were asking, too. Yeah. So. I mean, if, if council would like, I can write this and yeah, on behalf yeah. of the village. I have no, no problem with that. So, yeah, we can do that. Thank you. Okay. Do you all want to make a motion on that? Are you all good with it? I'm, well, let's make make a motion on it so we can be yeah. Okay. See, because because see, my, my and I have to go along with more. You know, and and this and others, you know, this project didn't just come up today. And, and for for granted, it's just a letter of support. But you know, to me, common courtesy says to 
a public, you know, we're, we're public officials that, you know, if, if we're not notified, at least our staff is notified and we have a chance to at least think about what we're asked to do, ask some questions to, to make sure we're satisfied and then, then go forward. But to, to, to keep getting items that have these short deadlines on them and then, you know, you, you're putting it on council and if all council doesn't, doesn't do it, what's council? But, you know, at least give us the opportunity to, uh, to look at the information, to be able to ask questions, and then our, our meetings could be very short. So, yeah. Well, and the other thing is what we put into a letter of support will then be used in the future to, you know, lead to what the village is committing to. So it, it does have more meaning than that. Um, but I, I would like to make a motion to uh, have Patty draft a letter of support for this project on behalf of the village. I'll second that motion. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Um, Patty, if you could, when you've written the letter, send it out to us. Mm -hmm. If there is an, you know, if there's significant objection, then, you know, it, it won't go out. But I, I can't anticipate that that would happen. I think that I have a nine o'clock meeting in the morning. John, we have we have a nine o'clock meeting in the morning, and uh, hopefully I'll get in and get it out to you before that, and then I can review it. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, finally, um, there are nominations from the uh, Human Relations Commission and also Planning Commissions. I'll let Human Relations go first. Okay. Uh, so, Aaron Sari has come forward interested in being an alternate to HRC. Uh, as I think Council knows, we have lots of work, so the more people the better. And I know we've all worked with Aaron. Uh, I mean, he's very engaged in the issues that we're dealing with. So uh, I think he's an amazing candidate, and so I strongly support him. And so I'd like to make a motion to approve his application. Second. Did, did you second? I did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, I heard all four voices. Um, and then I would like to um, nominate uh, Susan Stiles to the Planning Commission. She's a long-term Yellow Springer. She lives in the township and we need someone to take John Strewing's position. He's been eager to step down um, because I think he'd just like his Monday nights back. <laughs> um, but he's been a really um, important person on the Planning Commission. Um, he uh, has led us through many, many meetings, and um, so it was good to finally find someone who is exceptionally qualified to take his place. Uh, she has served on the Economic Sustainability Committee. She um, is a former head of the Green Metropolitan Housing, so she's been involved with planning in many ways. Um, Jerry and I had a very good interview with her and felt very strongly she was an excellent candidate for this position. So uh, we both, I think, strongly nominate mm -hmm. her for Planning Commission. Uh, I second it. <laughs> uh, all those in favor, or say aye. 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 Okay. Um, so now, manager's report. Um, we've basically gone over everything in the report with the um, exception of uh, that we are beginning our preliminary meetings with HNTB on the design part of the water plant this week and so I will keep council posted on that. Okay. Um, everything else I think we've already covered. Right. Um, and uh, there are interview questions for the law There director. are some potential interview questions in your packet uh, for the, the <coughs> law director position, the solicitor position. Judy uh, was kind enough to come up with this list. Um, so if you want to read through them and if you have any questions, you want to add something, you want to change something, if you can send it to Judy because she has it in a Word mm -hmm. document. Okay. All right. Um, and Thank maybe we'll, we'll bring this back. We've got, this will be after our next meeting, Correct. right? So Correct. perhaps if people, we can maybe have a discussion of these at our next meeting. Okay. okay. All right. Um, <coughs> clerk's report, I think, is next. Yeah, and you know, you can... You can look at it. There's nothing earth shattering there. The one thing I would like to do is just 
uh, the information from Regional Planning and Coordinating Commission for Green County meets its member and alternate designation for 2015. So I just wanted to check in with you folks, make sure you still are good with that. And then is Karen the Karen alternate? Is the alternate for that. I don't assume she's still okay. She goes to those meetings Let's, for yeah. entertainment. She is a, she's <laughs> a trooper about going to those meetings when I can. Okay, good enough. That's all I had. Okay, great. Um, all right, so um, we will be going into an executive session for the purpose of discussion, discussing uh, village-owned real estate. Uh, will we be sure. coming out with a meeting? Potentially, then? yes. Okay, so we will potentially come back with a decision. It should be short, you're saying? It should be very short. Okay, so um, we will do that. Uh, do we want to do agenda planning before we go into executive session yes so please okay <laughs> i think so um, and, I, and i'll stay regard and i'll stay regardless it's okay but i, I would like Find to be able to go back there and <laughs> wrap it up while you guys here. are out here so. right yeah no i agree um uh what uh, what what is on our next agenda um right now i don't think we have any ordinances coming up no. the charter review committee Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll and you know that I, I'm sorry I needed to take that off we had quite a discussion um, the solicitor and I about the necessity of, of an ordinance and it is not a necessity uh, yeah, so okay that well, can just we'll, we'll just give a report okay good mm -hmm. well but you, we have to bring we have to we have to nominate the nominations yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and I think we will have another discussion of goals hopefully Karen and and yeah. Marianne Goals. will be able to do that. Um, the, um, I think uh, we are going to be having another discussion of the, the grant proposal. Yeah, and, and, uh, and I guess the Energy Board, maybe as part of the Energy Board report, we ask for monthly reports on the solar thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the standardizing commissions or whatever. Labeling that. Will you be? Oh, so you're going to have a review draft statement of responsibilities. Right. Okay. And a brief okay. discussion. All right. Um, and then. Um, oh, it says a sidewalk policy. Yes, yeah, just <coughs> on your future. Yeah. When you want to torture yourself. It's, further. it's one of the. It's one of the that cost saving measures that yeah. that we presented to council that. We were going to deal with after the first of the year. Oh, um, mm -hmm. the, the sidewalks was the big one. Right. So <coughs> will you be ready to do that on? Uh, yeah, we're, we're actually ready. You are ready? Okay. So, It'll be a big one. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there there are various options to discuss, but we have them all potentially laid out. So. Okay. Um, it'll be our first discussion. I think we'll plan to have it be a, a more than one meeting. And what I would like to see is I would like to see the times put on. I think it's helpful um, so that we can say, okay, we're okay. gonna we're gonna try to do this in a half hour, mm -hmm. and then yep. if if it needs more than that, and when it will, um, we can go to the next next meeting. Um, try try to just not have these late meetings. And, and then uh, we were also going to, the joint meeting, to township trustees oh, yeah. should right. be on the next that. one. And discussing the uh, village solicitor questions? Yes, mm -hmm. the solicitor questions. Um, and that is your last meeting before the presentation, so? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with the township, don't, I mean, they have to replace a member now, right. correct? So, so I... They may want to delay. They, they may. Yeah, yeah, I would rather let, you know, let's just send them a note and let, let them come back to us and say when they're, <coughs> because they may not feel yeah. that they're ready till they appoint a new member. I can just, I can pass on to Karen to just put yes. the word out to them that when they're ready, let us, let right. that, right. that I think would be a yeah. thing good. to do. Good, and good thinking about that. This is what happens when it gets late. <laughs> well, rinky-dink uh, resolution about a membership. I'll ha I might have a couple of those, but okay, no big deal. Yes, right. Uh -huh. Our uh -huh. annual membership dues. Here. Okay. What are we? We're we're, <coughs> we're going to be coming with the recommendation. Yeah, for she's got for the commission. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing village real estate. So moved. Second. 
Esklund? Yes. Sims? Yes. Hausch? Yes. Queen? Yes. I'm going to take a five minute break. Oh, that was um, okay, the motion would be for um, me to negotiate a new lease uh, on the property at 6550 uh, State Route 68 with Stony Creek Botanicals at $750 per month. And Stony Creek Botanical is formerly Yellow Springs Botanicals. It's the old, uh, it's the Gary Gary's Dutchman property. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so moved. Second. Um, any discussion? Uh, all in favor, say aye. Well, actually, um, Patty, do you just want to reiterate? Um, why we're um, we looked at the value of the property we looked at comparable uh, properties that other lease properties that we own and uh, came up with uh, that cost as a comp comparison to a similar sized acreage on um, other leased properties that we own which are primarily agricultural right, leases correct. that we do so um, even though this is a commercial entity we are valuing it or at roughly the same at as roughly uh, the same okay okay, okay. so um, all in favor say aye. 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 And I hear no opposed, so uh, the motion carries. And I believe I can also now entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 And that's it. Chair. Thank you all for Thank your. You.